be where Eve's that has a circular fruit, so that's coming with roots. That was there at the lodge. Good morning, everyone. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I would like to first thank everyone who's in the room for the meeting and the people who are online. And before we start, I'd also like to thank our Roseburg staff for the tour yesterday. The tours turn out to be quite a highlight for serving on this commission. So thank you to the to the staff, to Sarah Gregory and Chris Kearns and all of the staff in the Roseburg area and for a great lunch, so thank you. Um, also, I would like to mention um, the Cow Creek tribe who were with us on part of the tour. And we got a presentation last night from them that was informative to say the least. They, were, they talked about their natural resources work and not just the natural resources work, but also the impacts it's having um, the, the, on the education programs that they have. And also, and this one wasn't was unexpected because I hadn't thought about it before in those terms, but their natural resource work and their arrangement with the department is also um, giving them contacts um, with members that are not in the area, with family and members living elsewhere. So it was an important meeting last night and we just got to hear from the Cow Creek. So thank you for that to them. Um, we do have a short update on the recruitment process later on today, but that'll come later. I'm Mary Wall, Chair of the Fish and Wildlife Commission. I'd like to call our Friday, um, March, 15th, 2024 meeting to order. I live in Langlois on the South Oregon coast, and I'd like to have the rest of the commissioners introduce themselves. Okay, good morning, Becky Hatfield Hyde, and uh, we ranch in uh, near Brothers, Oregon, in the high desert, and also in the Klamath Basin. Good morning, Mark Labhart, um, and I live in Sisters. Bob Spellbrink, uh, Select, Oregon. Dr. Leslie King, Portland Metro. Hi, Kathy and Khalil, Portland. Sorry for not being there in person. Today is medical match day, so I'm here with my family. Thank you for being here at all on that day. <clears throat> in the Director Melcher, but I'm thank waiting you. for the volume on that one to go. Yeah, yeah thank you. And uh, good morning. I'm Kurt Melcher, Director of the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Michelle. Good morning, I'm Michelle Tate with the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. I'm here today to support the director and the commission so that they can conduct this meeting in a hybrid. Um, I wanna thank Umpqua Community College for allowing us to meet here and host us at this beautiful venue. Um, we have, um, we're still using the loan, loaner sound equipment. So again, these microphones are um, not as sensitive as some of them that we've been used to. So you need to make sure that you're up close enough for us to hear and have a good afternoon. I would also like to recognize um, the state representative from the area, the state that I'm from, uh, Representative Court Boyce. Thank you. Director. Very good. Thank you, Chair Wall. We'll commence then with the director's report. Uh, and we have a number of items for you today. So please bear with us. We did deliver the field reports in written form and happy to answer any questions you might have on those. Otherwise, I'll call Deputy Director Shannon Hearn up to give us the expenditure report. Good morning, Director Melcher, Chair of all of our Chair of Field Hyde, members of the Commission. Um, exciting uh, financial report. I think most of the months that I give a financial report is kind of standard business and an update, but we did finally have the kickoff meeting for the 25-27 budget um, development. So exciting off the press news there. Um, real quick for the 23-25 biennium, um, in your packet, you have the financial report and it shows the graph of expenditures and revenues and it also has where we're at in the biennium and where we're projected on spending, still looking good there. For the month ending January 31st, 2024, unrestricted cash finished at 49.5 million. And restricted cash ended the month at 64.6 million for a total of 114.1 million filled by Treasury for us. 
Um, this represents a slight increase in restricted cash, about 2.5 million, and another decrease in unrestricted cash, um, 6.9 million. We are holding a big federal invoice that they have not paid yet, which is about 6.8 million, and that, that's why we're carrying this load, um, <laughs> which adds to the explanation I gave last month. I showed you the graph of restricted and unrestricted. Um, it's the undedicated, unrestricted funds that really are our operating reserves. Um, so that's that um, 49.5 million you'll see there. And as we talk more about 25, 27 budget development, we'll keep highlighting that unrestricted cash operating reserves and why that's a critical part of the discussion. But yesterday, uh, March 14th, we did get 25, 27 agency request budget development instructions at a DAS. Um, I checked and last night, the instructions were posted on their website as well. I've not gone through all those pages yet. There's a set overall for developing agency request budgets, and then there's a capital um, budget instruction uh, separate document as well. So if you're going to ask for bonding and do capital improvements and capital construction, there's different directions for that. Um, we have not received back our um, policy option packages with vetting through the governor's office, but they have given us um, direction that we are Go ahead to start talking with our, our stakeholders and our commission. Yes. Um, but again, the governor has established different expectations for the process that we use. And they really wanted us to make clear that the discussion regarding um, to agency request budget is this is draft packages and budget items that have not been fully reviewed by the governor's office and incorporated into the development process are discussion only. Um, and once items are vetted, we will not be adding um, or removing them. So they really want to hear what um, folks do support, not support, mm -hmm. but they are still vetting at the end what will go into our agency request budget. And I have to answer questions if that didn't fully make sense. Um, to give adequate notice for that first public meeting, I moved it from March 21st to April 4th. I resubmitted that graphic so that you can see that change in your packet. Um, invites will go out again to our external budget advisory committee email list, and then we have a conservation email list. I um, pulled those lists together and I counted over 150 <laughs> stakeholder emails that that will go to. So we'll, we'll send out official invites and then we'll do the public uh, meeting notice, which is standard. And we like to give two weeks ahead of holding that meeting and a reminder in the middle. Um, the meeting will provide an overview of several things kind of setting the stage here. Um, the first is the funding success that we've had in 23-25 legislatively approved budget, because of course we have short session in 2022 and 2024, we've been successful in adding those, those um, budget items into that um, overall budget portfolio. So we wanna highlight that. We really wanna highlight partnering in that, how successful have we been um, working with our support, supporters and stakeholders. And then we'll look at the state revenue forecast. Um, they shared that yesterday as part of budget instructions. It's, it hasn't changed since March revenue forecast, which is out there again, if folks wanna go, go read it. We are healthy as a state, um, but we're not um, projecting big revenue uptakes. We're also not predicting a recession. So it's a pretty good soft landing after for a long time they were thinking um, pandemic we, and the, this inflation, we really hit hard. So that was good news. We do anticipate a constrained general fund and lottery fund environment. We always have the competing ask against agencies. So I'll highlight some of the information we've been provided there. Um, and part of a constrained environment is cost curtailment. So we always know that reduction list that we'll have to build later in April is really impactful and we'll, we'll be careful when we're doing that, but we're not ready to highlight that yet. We will give a high level program prioritization and reduction estimate um, so people can see what we're, what we're looking for on this reduction exercise that we've been given statutorily. Um, we'll also daylight those policy option packages, which I know everyone really wants to see. Um, I'm really hopeful with the um, instructions and the work that um, Deputy Director Colbert and the Fish Wildlife Habitat Program team did around climate resiliency and species resiliency, that a lot of the supporters' voices are already there, these policy option packages. Um, the other item that we were given 
um, by the governor's office is agency resiliency. So in a constrained environment, still look at what you need to be doing good customer service, responding to um, your clients and representing the agent agency well. So that's built into those policy option packages. We plan to record this meeting. Um, it will be a hybrid meeting, this first public meeting, so people can attend um, as they're able to, and then they can watch a recorded version if they're if they're not. We're also going to open up another comment form. We've done this several by M. It's pretty successful to have people sit down, and we can direct them to questions that we're we're really interested in about our budget. Um, and then I'll come back April 19th after that fourth meeting, do another financial report update on that, and I'll highlight, really summarize what we've heard so far today. You'll get to see those policy option packages in this, but you'll have have access to the links and those budget materials that the public has as well. Don't want you surprised. I know you're going to get calls. Um, and then we'll start highlighting for you 25-27 budget scenarios by fund type. And for license fund, that does include consideration of a fee adjustment which Kurt and I talked a little bit about last month. Um, I did put in an update on the audit committee. Um, ODFW audit committee uh, was scheduled to meet on Tuesday. We did meet. Um, we had a good overview of the hazardous spill response and education program spending audits. Um, the auditor provided updates on where she's at with the recruitment and retention audit and the public records request audit. Um, neither of those have actually uh, started yet. And I can answer questions if you if you want reasoning there. And then we also discuss progress implementing recommendations for past audits because you have open audit findings. So we went through those as well. We're excited for the next meeting when we get to start planning for the next audit period and what what goes on there. But then again, having Commissioner Spellbrink there is very helpful. Thank you. Yep. And that concludes my report. Thanks. Thank you. A lot tacked into that couple minutes. Questions from the commissioners? I do have a couple, Shannon, and thank you for the report. When you talk about the the way that discussion will happen with the policy option packages and that those are recommend it would be recommendations from us to the governor's office. Can you talk, can you just highlight what's different in that process from before? Because it seems like it shifts the discussion of the stakeholders a bit to the governor's office in it just would be useful to hear how you see that shift. Sure, uh, Cheryl, it's, it's been evolving. So currently how I see it, what I've understood is they have control of the list, right? And they'll be taking input of, you know, what stays and, and if the list is complete. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the ask recently came out um, that they will want commissions and boards to kind of bucketize their priorities um, and that should be in the budget instruction, instruction. So I'll be able to lay that out April 19th about what categories they want you to give them. But when you look at climate, climate resiliency and agency resiliency, like what's a high priority in those common themes okay. for addressing both? And they have, they'll have three categories that they'll lay out for you. So. I think it does, but I think we'll know when, we, when it plays out because this is just a bit of a different process. In, um, we'll see. Yeah, but it's helpful to have the the explanation. One other question I have is, and we're going to have some people on public forum talking about the marine reserves, and I've had a couple of questions. Could you just talk about where that one is? I know we got money in the legislature, some stuff that we had thought we had before or we had looked at before, but where is that one? I just want to make sure I know where it is. Terrible. Great question. Deputy Director Colbert is going to come up and talk about 24 <laughs> session in a minute. So I'm not going to steal any thunder for her. Okay. I know she's going to cover that. But I will say this is the delicate dance when you come out of a short session with a lot of funding. Most of it comes from general fund. And then you're asked to develop a reduction exercise right behind it. And we will have to be clear of like where gives are in that general fund. And it is it is a delicate dance. And it's it's all valuable and important. Uh, Chair Wall, if I might, I, I would just add, uh, of course, the 10% reduction list is statutorily mandated. So yeah. we're in this situation right now where we've got all these increases in general fund, and then we're going to go through an exercise to reduce general fund. <laughs> so that's, that's what Shannon was mentioning. And then I would just say on the, on the topic, bigger picture, picture discussion of budget development, you know, every administration is different. And 
I've been in the director's office now for four administrations and you know they all approach the budget process differently. You know, we've been through the zero based budget um, type process to the just standard current service level process. And this one is is slightly modified, mainly just in the timing. Um, and of course, the, the chief executive wants to, you know, wants to have some input in how how budgets are developed. So. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. Oh, so Shannon, you, you mentioned about the public meeting. <clears throat> so we're about a month away from when you will give us the results of that public meeting and the policy the option packages. So and then you said you wanted to give give that out, uh, that notice out two weeks ahead of time. So we can anticipate that it's probably within the next two weeks the public will find out what the date is, the timing for this public meeting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair Wall, Commissioner Lebhart. Um, that's exactly. It. We'll 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 send out invites and start posting materials so that we're, you know, a lot of our stakeholders are now aware. I've filled with several calls. We even have letters in supporting our budget items already before. So okay. there's there's a very well tuned group that are watching and are waiting for that invite. Um, but we want to let all the public know in some as best we can that they're invited as well. So the, the, that those will go out. We'll have another financial report. Then we'll have another public engagement meeting in May 16th, kind of really dig into funding scenarios and fee adjustment scenarios. And then we'll bring it to you in June. And all of those steps, except for director's report in April, have public engagement involved in them. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm mostly interested in the pops. And Everyone is. <laughs> I'm not interested in the pops. <laughs> Very good. Commissioner. I might. Go ahead. Sure, well, yeah, I just thought it might be a good time to mention, since I think this is Director Melcher's last meeting, uh, to mention the fact that, you know, the the financial condition of the uh, of the department now compared to when he showed up. So uh, I think we owe him a lot of credit for that. A moment of applause. We're celebrating all day. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of uh, well, just say there. thank you. Go I ahead. appreciate I appreciate the recognition, but of course, it, you know, as always, it's it's a it was a we effort. It wasn't a me effort. So, but I do appreciate the recognition. It's leadership, though. <laughs> well, thank you, Cheryl, and thank you, commissioners. Silvering for recognizing Director Melcher. I didn't at the start because I did not want to give you a teary financial report. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. All right. Um, and then I also recognizing Commissioner Spelberg on the audit committee. We do have a meeting planned um, with Commissioner King, who is our budget representative. So she'll get the first look at policy option package. Can't yeah, wait. <laughs> I might mention also that uh, here's how impressed I am with uh, Kari Guy, our uh, internal auditor. Boy, she seems me. She's really sharp, doing a great job. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. I would just add on the internal audit um, topic. Uh, you know, there's actually a statute that requires agencies to have internal auditors. Of course, many agents don't. We never did. Um, we ask for general fund funding several so biennia for uh, to fund an internal auditor. We never received that. And so so we reprioritize our resources. And you know, we really think internal audit function really brings value to the agency. And uh, and I would second your your feelings that uh, Kari Guy is doing an exceptional job. Thank you. Thanks, Shannon. Okay, next up we'll have the legislative update <clears throat> from Dr. Debbie Colbert. Good morning. It's a little intimidating having representative voice in the room while I give my legislative report. <laughs> you can correct me if I get any. Say that again. I have not. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, for the record, I'm Debbie Colbert, Deputy Director for 
Fish and Wildlife Programs, and uh, wanted to just give you a quick update on the 2024 legislative session. It was a what we call a short session. In fact, it was even shorter uh, than predicted. They finished a few days early, and um, so 32 days and almost 300 bills introduced during that time. Um, I thought I would just kind of recap for you the bills I thought you'd be most interested in, and then also just share a few observations um, from the last few sessions. I'll start with, uh, I think, the, the, the bill of most interest. Uh, this is uh, Senate Bill 17501, and we call, it, we call it the end of session bill. It's kind of the omnibus budget bill. As many of you know, um, often bills are introduced in policy committees that have a cost, and so they get referred to ways and means, um, and, which, and that's where kind of any of the financial pieces of those bills have to be reconciled with agency budgets. Um, in the last few sessions, those policy bills show up in these omnibus um, budget bills rather than actually being passed out as the policy bills. So I was just going to highlight a few things that showed up for us in uh, the end of session bill. I didn't print my slides, so I have to kind of apologize and turn a little bit. I can't remember what order I put these in. Um, really, I would say um, for a short session, we did really well in terms of some important investments. I'll talk about things that didn't pass, which were disappointment, but um, really pleased to see uh, a number of things show up for us. And I just want to be clear that this, oh my God, thank you, Commissioner Laphart, thank you. Um, when you see things like this show up in our budget, it is almost entirely because of the outstanding work of stakeholders that we work very closely with. Um, just can't state enough how important they are um, and how supportive they are of the agency and, and, and making sure that we have the resources to get important work done. And of course, you know, Klamath fish reintroduction, top of the list. Uh, so we were really excited to see some general fund for the agency. This will be permanent positions in the agency's budget, one full-time and two seasonals to help our staff there to conduct the really critical monitoring and other work that's going to be necessary as part of those fish reintroduction efforts. So that was that was great to see. We were also very excited to see some key investments on chronic wasting disease, surveillance and prevention. Um, some of you may have been tracking House Bill 4148, and this is a good example of there was a policy bill that had a number of things related to wildlife passed unanimously out of committee and went to Ways and Means. And so portions of that bill show up in this end of session bill. Um, for us, it's almost $800,000 in general fund. That's going to include a position in our health lab full time and a number of seasonal positions to help with the surveillance and, and um, check stations and that type of work. It also includes um, additional funding for um, vendors. Uh, you know how we have different folks like um, meat processors and others that we pay for them to collect samples as they're processing meat. So it includes a little bump in the available money we have for that. Um, I would also note uh, related to this, Oregon State University's Vet Diagnostic Lab also got close to $2 million in general fund to really advance kind of in-state testing work. Um, this will be focused on zoonotic diseases, but it will specifically include a focus on um, chronic wasting disease. As you know, right now, we have to send those samples out of state. Uh, it's a pretty significant turnaround time. We're hoping this, this investment in the OSU lab is gonna really help in terms of that. Also things of note to mention, you know, sometimes you get funding so those are examples of general fund that is new funding to the agency. Sometimes we may have um, money, but we don't have the limitation to spend that money. So a good example of that are the next two items on this list. Um, we have our private forest accord grant program and we got the revenue uh, last session, but we needed the limitation to actually be able to spend it so it included $10 million for that grant program to spend 
their existing women um, revenues. We also were really excited um, in the 23 session, the legislature set aside $10 million for natural and working lands, identified four agencies that were eligible to apply for grants through the um, Oregon Climate Action Commission. And um, ODFW was one of the four agencies. We went through the process of uh, submitting the proposal as a joint state agency proposal, and we were awarded just over 3 million of that 10 million. And so we got this biennium's uh, limitation. So we got those funds from um, OWEB, but we couldn't spend them until the legislature gave us the limitation. So we got the limitation for this biennium. Uh, we also got the limitation related to the Disaster Peak Ranch acquisition. And then I wanted to mention just not things for ODFW, but things that I know that you all have paid attention to in the past. Um, OWEB did get $5.2 million for their Ag Heritage Program. You know, this is very relevant to what we're going to be talking about later on climate and uh, working lands. So we're we're really excited to see that significant investment. And then um, Department of Agriculture got a, about a million dollars in general fund for invasive species work for their council, which we can participate very heavily in for grants on invasive species and also outreach work. So all good things. The next biggie that I wanted to kind of share with you is Senate Bill 1561. And this relates to the Monsanto settlement. And I, I think we've all mentioned this before, but I'll just uh, mention it again. The state of Oregon uh, entered into a settlement with Monsanto Corporation over PCB contamination. Monsanto Corporation and its predecessor companies are really the sole entity responsible for PCB in the environment today. Um, Oregon really held its ground on the settlement uh, and made what I think is the highest settlement with Monsanto Corporation of any state. I may be wrong. Kurt, does that sound right? By an order of magnitude at least. So the final settlement was close to $800 um, million. And the, so that money was with Department of Justice and during this short session, the legislature set up a governance approach for how they would use that money. And you can imagine that one version of that might have been to just kind of spend it out, right? One time programs, you know, agency budgets, that kind of stuff. Really exciting to see the legislature actually set this up as more of an endowment. So those funds, after paying for attorney costs, they're about $580 million dollars will go to treasury. They will try to invest them for you know, maximum interest, long-term earnings. And then the interest earned each biennium will actually support work related to contamination. And so if you think about the fact that we will be living with PCBs in perpetuity, really very exciting to see this type of an approach so that these funds can also be available for generations to come. And um, the way that they set up the structure for governance is they divided the interest for each biennium into three areas. 25% of the interest will go to Oregon's nine uh, federally recognized tribes, and they will be it will be split evenly um, unless they decide a different formula and, and come back to legislature. 25% will be going through a new granting entity, an environmental justice uh, restoration council, which will be staffed by OWEB. So if you think about OWEB, it, you've got the OWEB board. Now OWEB will have a second uh, council that they will be staffing, that will be giving, they will be giving out funds to support uh, restoration, remediation and other work really geared toward disproportionately impacted communities in Oregon. And then the, the remaining 50% of the interest will go to state agencies that have a nexus with the settlement terms. So, you know, you immediately think of folks like Department of Fish and Wildlife, and uh, at least I do, um, and DEQ and Health Authority. Um, and so 
we will be working with OWEB, the agency, um, to help them. We did get a permanent position in our habitat program to essentially support OWEB staff and uh, leadership in setting up this new council, which will establish the metrics and the priorities for both the agency funds and the community funds. And the great thing is uh, that the state agency funds specifically were designated that they could go over multiple biennium. You know, one of the things when you think about contamination, um, these are long-term efforts. So, you know, you need to understand where they're occurring, how they are affecting species, um, what things you can do to benefit species. You know, it's very difficult as an agency to approach that work in like one year grants. Right. So we were really excited that they specifically said that the agency programs could span multiple biennium. And, you know, that that's how you can track progress and see progress with those types of longer term programs. Um, I think that's it on that one. Yeah, uh, sorry, Dr. Colbert. Um, could you explain a little bit about the Restoration Council? And you said it's within OWEB. Like, could you explain that again? And is it appointed? Like, is it sort of like how we send someone, like Commissioner Laphart, to OWEB? I mean, how is that, or has that been defined? How that's going to work? Yes, um, the the bill does specify the membership of the uh, council. And it will include, for example, the director of ODFW. Um, it includes uh, uh, an appointment by uh, the attorney general, the treasurer, uh, community organizations. So I, I think it's about an 18 member board. And like OWEB, they will do grant making. So OWEB staff will help them develop rules and announcement processes, and then they'll solicit grants review grants, prioritize them, and then award them based on the funding that's available. Okay, thank you. A couple, just a few more bills to highlight that I thought you would be um, excited to see. Uh, House Bill 4132 was related to marine reserves, and this bill passed the short session and uh, directs the agency to implement recommendations from the Ocean Policy Advisory Council. Um, it includes uh, three positions, uh, staffing positions and some other kind of um, general fund for research and contracting and other work. So again, this, been, this has been a long time uh, coming and we were excited to see that it passed this short session. Also wanted to mention Senate Bill 1509, uh, the Gilnet Buyback Work Group. Um, this is directing the department to convene a, about a six member work group uh, that includes both commercial, recreational and other interests to essentially, can, we'll be a convener of the group and then we will help kind of facilitate them in identifying any recommendations on what a possible voluntary buyback uh, program might look like for Oregon. And um, especially, compared to kind of what was adopted in the state of Washington. So we will have to report back to the legislature with any of that work group's recommendations in the fall. And then lastly, I just wanted to mention that House Bill 4080. This is again, really focused more on, on DLCD, but I know that it's been front of mind for many of you and it directs uh, DLCD to develop a uh, roadmap for development of offshore wind and it specifically um, notes that it is that roadmap and the development of the roadmap must engage communities, it must engage other state agencies. So, um, and it included uh, some resources to help DLC do that, that work. And, you know, I think it's just a really a positive for us because I think all of the state agencies have been actively engaging on offshore wind development. Um, mm, as kind of a reaction to some of the federal processes. And I feel like this is going to give us a good place for the state of Oregon to convene and to really kind of be thoughtful about its um, approach to offshore wind. So I think it's going to be a positive place for good dialogue and community engagement. Can I ask a quick follow up on that one? I mean, most agencies would typically go do a roadmap 
when they got a new assignment. So this one, is this so that Oregon will slow down just a bit and look at more at the, the wind power and what the impacts might be? Is that kind of what this bill is about? From my perspective, I, I think it gives the state some critical resources to actually do that kind of work. Um, I, I don't think that there's really been much investment uh, to date to help the agencies engage. Um, like us, most of the agencies have been really just trying to um, reprioritize positions, you know, um, with limited new resources. So, so this is a good step for staffing up a state agency. That helps. Thank you. A quick question on the marine reserves. The o OSU and OPEC have both given a lot of recommendations over time, does this put us in a position where we can look at those and give us the a leg up, if you will, on implementation of some of those? Yes, Chair Wall, Commissioners, um, that's exactly that these investments um, are specifically to give us the capacity to implement those recommendations that came out of that, uh, I believe it was a 2020, 20, 2022. 2022 report. Thank you. Dr. Deb, I have another question. Um, it is also about the Marine Reserves. Um, and this gets to the delicate dance that um, Deputy uh, Hearn mentioned. So where did this Marine Reserves money come from? And then the 10% reduction and explain how we're going to enter that vortex, it, basically, in a month. <laughs> sure, well, Commissioner King. <laughs> Um, I'm going to use the word vortex um, at a later date. So one more, because this is going to lead to some, I think, kind of challenging conversations about our 10% reduction list. Um, it's a good problem to have, to, to have received general fund in the short session. Um, but uh, we some of these things are permanent. So that means that the math will change for us in the sense that We'll have a bigger general fund identified, which means we'll have a 10% of a bigger number is a bigger number. Um, and so I, I think that that's going to be one of the tough things that we'll all have to be talking about is, um, you know, how do we achieve those uh, reductions? You know, we've always been protective of existing programs. Um, so, you know, just as an extreme example, um, you know, three new positions and marine reserves, we wouldn't typically go and um, put existing marine reserve staff on the list so that we could save the vacant ones. So that's an extreme example, but you are um, keying in on, on a really tough conversation that, that we'll have to be having with the commission as we develop the 25-27 budget. And to follow on with that, that is how it, it, it's conversations like this and the pop that was created that was part of the 10 percent reduction and how this was defunded in the first place am, am i understanding that properly or at least generally well um it wasn't defunded two of the three are new positions mm -hmm. um one of them is one that is returned to the agency but we had had um difficulty filling it in the past and mm -hmm. because it was vacant for so long they took it got it as part of the they they tend to look at vacant positions and they sweep any that have stayed vacant for an extended period. Okay. Um, we don't okay. think any general fund reductions are a good idea. I mean, yeah, if I might, I would just say, I mean, that that position that you're mentioning, uh, Commissioner King, was in our budget. Right. It was not in the government. It was not theirs exactly, and that that was the 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 rub. That's right. that was the conflict. Okay. And that's that's the dance that we're going to be having. Yes. Yep. Got it. But I, I think, you know, a well, wrestling match or whatever we're going to call it. <laughs> again, it is a good problem to have. Um, we're we are excited to have these additional general fund investments. Um, and, you know, from the agency's perspective, we do have to do the 10 percent reduction list. But, you know, as you can imagine, that doesn't mean we we make things, you know, we don't think there's anything that's easily reduced. We think all of the that we have. Um, including these most recent ones are critical and important. So that will be the message that we share. Thank you. Other things, just in case you were tracking bills um, that uh, 
didn't make it through the session. There was House Bill 4014, which would have given about one and a half million dollars to the um, OCRF uh, committee to help landowners that are dealing with uh, beavers on the landscape to try to really encourage uh, uh, coexistence with beavers. Uh, that was not funded. Uh, I do have the sense that Rep Marsh, who uh, was the chief sponsor of the bill, will be returning with that bill in um, 2025. So we'll see that one again. Uh, there was also Representative Levy has House Bill 4061, which would have set up a, a pilot program around elk damage, one, one pilot compensation program on the east side, one on the west side. That was also not funded. Uh, House Bill 4107 was another bill Rep. Levy introduced um, for wolf compensation that would have added uh, different formulas for um, multipliers on compensation, depending on the animal um, that was lost. And then lastly, House Bill 4148, which was that wildlife omnibus bill that I mentioned. One element of that was not funded in the Christmas tree bill, and that was the element that was related to coexistence. And you all re recall, because that was an important package that we had in our agency request budget that didn't get funded. Um, it, this, it was not funded. Um, I, I think there was a lot of support, and I, and I think a little bit of head scratching on how it didn't end up in the Christmas tree bill. Um, but, you know, I, I I would anticipate that that will be something that we'll be discussing about investments needed for 2025 um, in the agency request budget. And, and really showing you these bills not passed kind of leads to my last slide, which is just some observations um, about, you know, from an ODFW perspective, trends, and you know, kind of what kinds of bills are we seeing out there um, that I think raised some really interesting conversations and are very relevant. You know, again, we're going to be talking about working lands in a minute. Um, so, you know, we continue to see over the last several biennium bills around coexistence with wildlife and conflict. You know, so you've got the wolf multiplier, right? So, again, you know, how do we compensate for lost uh, uh, livestock, uh, elk damage? Um, Beavers on the landscape, coexistence, coexistence in urban areas. Um, I just, I, th I think it's worth noting that these bills continue to show up. And, and honestly, in 2023, there were even more around um, conflict and providing non-lethal options. And so just something to kind of be tracking as a, as a trend um, of interest and thinking about um, if these things are showing up in the legislature, that's probably something for the agency to go, hmm, what should we be doing on wildlife conflict? Are, are we seeing new trends? Is there, is there something there for us to be considering differently um, or new partnerships or, yeah, just, I think, it, I think it's an interesting thing for you all to be aware of and thinking about. Um, no surprise, continue to see a lot of bills around renewable siting. Um, we've been extremely engaged, you know, from our perspective, we continue to support uh, renewable energy, uh, but we also are kind of the voice in the room, you know, reminding everybody that there are there are options about how we cite that in a way that is responsible and uh, minimizes impact to wildlife. And then the same thing with housing siting. Again, you know, very much a state priority to cite additional housing, um, but again, trying to be the voice in the room to like say, you know, how do we do that? How do we do that in a way that makes sense um, from an um, impact and coexistence and conflict uh, perspective? So that's that's everything, uh, unless there are any questions that you have for me or other bills. We do have a couple of questions, um, Vice Chair. Yeah, maybe, maybe not questions, comments, statements. Um, I... Uh, I think that the uh, I just want to say that it, I'm I'm pleased to see that the Klamath Fish Reintroduction Work is funded. Uh, that the um, I'm interested <clears throat> in what the natural working lands stuff might be able to do, uh, and uh, pleased with the ag heritage funding. But I'm discouraged about the box that we seem to stay in around wolf compensation multiplier. Uh, and that we, um, first of all, I want to acknowledge that 
I think as a commission and as the department, we really did a, a good job with the recent re-upping of the wolf plan at kind of lowering the tone and the drama, recognizing um, that the poaching uh, that's going on is unacceptable, uh, but also understanding that we have to have um, a real plan to 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 work with communities that are actually dealing with these issues firsthand. I feel like our state is falling behind other states in terms of how they're handling compensation. And um, I just am hopeful that uh, this can come back around and somehow we get out of that negative box that it seems to be stuck in. Because it affects us, right? It affects our employees that are on the ground. Um, it affects our communities uh, that we work with every day. So just a thought, just a statement. Thank you. Commissioner yeah. Lavard. Yeah, thank, <clears throat> thank you, Chair Wall. I wholeheartedly agree with uh, Commissioner Hefner Hyde on that bill. <clears throat> and then, uh, you know, it's frustrating on the other bills that didn't pass too, but I debated whether I was going to say anything, but I, I just want to publicly say this again. The, the wildlife coexistence bill um, and representative voice was one of the ones that was in the committee that voted unanimously for this bill to pass out of committee. But we we had a committee that we formed of uh, varying points of view. They came together, made a recommendation to the department on a pop, went to the legislature this last short session, unanimous support. Uh, unanimous, almost unanimous testimony from warring parties, conservationists, uh, property owners, all came together in strong support. Bill passed out of the subcommittee, House Ag and Natural Resource, unanimously, and then got killed in, in ways and means. So it does say, uh, sends a message, I think, as you mentioned, Director, Deputy Director Colbert, is that it their strong support for the wildlife coexistence bill. It's a huge benefit to the department because we have all these organizations out there that are nonprofits that are doing really good things. When a you know a fawn gets hit and taken to a facility, they're nonprofits they, and they need some help and they need some funding. And um, it's it's a really good package. And I hope um, that uh, you know the House Ag and Natural Resource Committee moves this bill in the 25-27 session. So it's it just seems to have when you've got unanimous support from from groups that don't necessarily agree and like each other, it's just really frustrating that we can't get the legislature to unanimously agree that this is an important bill also. And not that the others aren't too, but um just want to express a little frustration there. And I've talked with Debbie about this too. So she's fully aware of it. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. <laughs> Appellant has not given up. Don't worry. <laughs> next. Thank you. Uh, our next item is the standing climate and ocean change report. And I think Debbie is staying for that. Okay. And she'll be joined by Davia Palmieri, Nick Myatt online, I believe. Craig Smith, likely also online. And Hillary Dulos, I think it's probably online as well. So. Sorry. I didn't see. That. <laughs> Do we have Nick and Hillary? Okay. Next. Do we have Nick and Hillary? We have Nick. Yes. And Hillary. Hello. Oh wow. Yeah, we have Hillary. <laughs> and Craig Smith. Do you need Craig? Um, you know, actually, Craig is going to join us uh, for a future one. Got it. Sorry for that change. So, um, Chair Wall is okay to get started then? Okay. Great. Right. 
Um, so just as a reminder, when we were with you in February, we talked about kind of how we are maturing some of our conversations about our climate and ocean policy, um, going from kind of looking at a number of species and, and how we are managing and learning about impacts to climate of climate on those species, and now kind of shifting to a conversation about uh, how we are responding. Um, looking for copies. Okay. All right. Um, so just as a reminder, this was the roadmap that we talked about last month. And so uh, we wanted to start with the conversation around natural and working lands. And today we're going to focus on ag and range lands. You know, I can imagine that you might say, well, why are we focused on ag and range lands? And um, I except for uh, Commissioner Hatfield Hyde. She's not asking that. Um, <laughs> but uh, this may not uh, be something that you know, but uh, farmlands and um, grazing lands are about half of the land in Oregon. So let that sink in. When you think about uh, species, that's where a lot of our wildlife are living and moving and uh, foraging. So we wanted to have a very intentional conversation with you today about uh, those, those partnerships and how we are thinking about ag and rangelands um, in the They provide obviously working lands and um, products for us but they also provide uh, carbon sequestration benefits. They, they add benefits to soil health. They provide habitat and connectivity for species. Um, they facilitate wildlife movement. There's just a number of benefits from those lands for people and for wildlife. Um, and kind of one of, the, one of the things that we've been talking about as leadership especially when you look at some of the conversations around renewable siting, housing. As an agency, we really can't take those lands for granted and the, and the benefits that they are providing for species. Um, because there's, there's a lot of potential to not have those lands in the same way that we have them today. Um, and what we have been thinking about as a leadership team is how can we be more intentional about engaging our working land partners and kind of ag and, and farmlands. What are the relationships that we could be kind of doubling down on to ensure those long term kind of people and wildlife benefits? I'm going to hand it off to Nick uh, to talk a little bit about kind of similarities of, of what species and and producers and farmers are facing. Go ahead, Nick. Thank you, Debbie. So um, or, Oregon's working lands and the people that depend on them are, are really experiencing stressors uh, from many different directions right now. And, and many of these stressors we can tie back to uh, a warming, drying climate. And unfortunately, these stressors are hitting the agricultural community at the same time uh, of a lot of economic pressures with inflation and interest rates and market uh, very volatile markets. Um, so we can look at kind of what the, the experiences of working lands and those folks are right now and compare that to some of the pressures that Oregon's native habitats and the species that depend on them are facing as well. If you compare these two lists, you see that uh, you know many of those stressors are, are the same uh, with fire, uh, drought, temperatures, extreme, uh, extreme weathers, and, and a lot of these are growing in frequency and severity. So uh, as, as Debbie kind of alluded to earlier, uh, working lands and wildlife, you know, we have, we have a lot more in common than not, and, and really experiencing a lot of those same stressors. Next slide, please. Um, there, there are some challenges in our work and working between working lands and wildlife uh, where the two interests do not align. And, and historically, we've, we've spent 
quite a bit of time as a department focusing on areas of tension or where there's conflict between working lands and wildlife. Uh, but to really tackle these climate cause stressors, we have to adapt and do things differently. Uh, as, as Debbie mentioned, we're, we want to intentionally focus on where we have shared interest with uh, working lands. And there's there's really many more opportunities for collaboration uh, where the stressors are impacting working lands and wildlife and where they align. This is really the, the sweet spot for our work where producers, ODF and W, and many of our partners can work together to uh, accomplish our shared objectives or shared interests to, to combat those impacts of uh, severe drought, uh, large, more intense fires, water quantity issues, invasive species, uh, and extreme temperatures. And even, even outside of those areas where we have shared uh, interests and objectives, we can we can be successful by spending time to understand where and why we differ in our interests. And you know, it, as Debbie mentioned, a lot of that is really building relationships and depending on relationships uh, to be able to understand those shared goals, and then having uh, the resources to provide technical and financial assistance for working lands. And as I as I as I give this presentation a look at this slide, the one thing that just jumped out at me is, you know, these circles in the slide don't overlap more than say 50%, but that's just for aesthetics of making a, a good looking presentation for you all today. Uh, these these circles probably should overlap by 80, 90%. There's really uh, not not that you know many areas where I think our interests don't align. Uh, next slides. So I did want to share uh, a really good example uh, that we have of the success story where we intentionally focused resources on those areas of alignment. Uh, we can look at the accomplishments uh, in Oregon to prevent sage grouse from being listed for federal protection. And uh, this was kind of an all hands on deck approach. And the slogan for this effort was what is good for the bird is good for the herd. And this captures the idea that whether you're trying to improve wildlife habitat or trying to improve grazing lands for cattle, uh, most of the practices that are implemented really accomplish both objectives. And in the face of a changing climate, identifying those aligned interests and uh, purposeful focused efforts like this are, are where we will really be successful in uh, reducing the risk of loss of species into the future. So in, in Baker County, uh, where I live over the last uh, 10 years or more, I've witnessed this in action with mm -hmm. our local implementation team uh, for mm -hmm. sage grouse. This team is made up of livestock producers and landowners, uh, federal land managers, state and federal wildlife managers, as well as local governments who've been working as a, a team collaboratively to tackle uh, some of those impacts and stressors that I've mentioned, like drought and fire, invasive species, and historic conversion of native habitats. Uh, this group has been very successful at bringing in millions and millions of dollars into the county uh, for rangeland improvement projects. And these projects include things like cross fencing, uh, large scale juniper removal, uh, water developments for improved grazing management. And a lot of the work is focused on invasive annual grass control and, and turning those non-native communities into uh, native perennial bunch grass communities. And uh, I just found out yesterday the OWEB board uh, will be out on the ground about a month from now, I think, touring some of the projects that that team has uh, implemented. Uh, but most of this work has been on private land uh, and it's it's not only benefited sage grouse but significantly benefited livestock operations as well i had uh, i can think back i had two producers that have pulled me aside and shared their story with me in the last year and they they originally got involved in this partnership uh, to implement habitat improvement projects and they they both told me that you know they were doing it to kind of do the right thing and they wanted to help wildlife but uh in the process, they uh, 
they, they didn't know kind of getting into it how significantly they were going to be increasing their available forage on their ranch, uh, improving their livestock weight gains. Uh, they, they installed a lot of infrastructure that made their management easier and ultimately increased the, the value of their operation. Uh, so it's just a, a great example of aligning an interest in, in that motto of what's good for the bird is good for the herd. And as we think about what we need to do to tackle some of these climate caused stressors, uh, we can see a lot of similar opportunities to this in forest management, uh, water projects and, and other practices on working lands that benefit both producers and wildlife. Uh, so I've stressed the need for that purposeful focus on those areas of alignment, um, but to successfully tackle the impacts of climate change, you know, we have to collaborate and we have to leverage partnerships uh, like we've done with this local implementation team. And next slide, please. Um, one of one of my favorite examples of leveraging partnerships to tackle the impacts of climate change is our uh, liaison positions that we have with the U.S. Department of Agriculture Natural Resources Conservation Service, uh, which we typically refer to as NRCS. Uh, these uh, Liaison positions are ODF and W employees uh, wearing wearing our uniform, our patch on their shoulder. That's uh, that are housed in NRCS offices to help implement NRCS uh, programs uh, in in sharing our expertise and helping shape uh, priorities and practices. We currently have five of those positions spread around the state in Tillamook, Tangent, the Dalles. Uh, Redmond and Klamath Falls. And based on prior success of these positions, we've we've been expanding the number of the positions and they've uh, recently became permanent positions last legislative session uh, instead of limited duration positions. And one of the reasons uh, that this is a very strategic partnership is because of the significant investments that NRCS uh, are currently making to combat the impacts of a warming, drying climate uh, through climate smart practices on working lands. And in 2023, uh, in, in Oregon alone, NRCS invested $243,000 per day on on-the-ground conservation. I want to flag that again, $243,000 per day. Uh, in conservation practices on the ground. So uh, it's pretty amazing opportunity. Uh, so wanted to turn it over now to Hillary, who is one of our uh, NRCS uh, ODFW liaisons to share some more information about the, the work that uh, she's accomplishing on working lands through this partnership with NRCS and producers. Thank you, Nick. Um... As you mentioned, I'm Hillary Dulos, and I am located primarily in the Dalles, and I work mostly with Wasco County, but also Hood River and Sherman counties to help implement NRCS programs. Um, a lot of uh, what Nick, has, I can reiterate a lot of what Nick said, but um, I think the one of the best things about these positions is that it allows ODFW staff to interact with landowners that we might not have typically worked with in the past. Um, a lot of our biologists work with landowners to deal with um, wildlife conflict, or some are working with landowners who are interested in providing public hunting access. But really the point of these positions and, the, and my position that I'm in is working with landowners on working lands to find the co-alignment of landowner goals and also address and meet natural resource ha habitat. Uh, goals and needs. So um, there's really a lot of um, co-benefit to these these projects. Um, and I would say that um, one one thing that is great about NRCS is that landowners are are used to working with NRCS. They're, they trust NRCS. It's an agency that's been around working with farmers and ranchers for decades to assist with soil health or erosion issues. And now the NRCS is kind of transitioned to more of um, addressing additional resource concerns and um, has a whole suite of practices available that provide more of a kind of uh, 
more ecologically beneficial practices and more landscape style efforts. Um, there's more partnerships being created. And then many of the practices that are available through NRCS are already kind of these climate resiliency practices that um, are, are beneficial for landowner operations, but also wildlife as well. Um, and so I've got some of the practices uh, that are being implemented on the screen here. We've, um, but, and, and some are more kind of catered towards farmland, some are more catered towards rangeland. Um, a lot that um, Nick mentioned through the sage grouse work um, apply through, I mean, throughout all of Oregon. So um, these things are being done everywhere. Um, and, and there's really a lot of, um, you know, focus on providing uh, perennial cover, um, increased bunch grasses, increased pollinator plantings, tree and shrub planting. So things that are gonna benefit uh, multiple species as well as provide um, improvements for the landowners depending on their operations. Um, I think really though, um, it's all these practices through NRCS are great, but really what makes a successful project is uh, the relationship that is developed with the landowners. Um, and so whatever we, whatever I'm talking about with the landowner, it has to work for them. Um, these are voluntary programs and finding ways to, to work together to meet landowner goals, use the available NRCS practices. Um, those things are then gonna find, or we're gonna find a co-benefit for wildlife in almost every situation. And a lot of times this means more, more listening and, and maybe less like instructing on thou shalt do the things this way. It's really, it's got to work for the landowner. Um, and at this point I've worked with, you know, dozens and dozens of landowners and everyone has a different story. Um, and so just learning about what that story is and how to, um, how to find that co-alignment between landowner goals and, and wildlife goals. Um, I have an example uh, of, a land, of working with a landowner. Um, it was actually the first landowner that I worked with um, from start to finish on a project. And um, when I first met him, I became clear that he was, this was not like a simple, um, this was not a simple project type. It was not a simple land. He had um, he had ag land, he ran cattle, he had range land, he had forest land, and he, he valued all of these different habitat types. He valued all these different activities for his, um, that he wanted to do on his land and, and to meet his operational goals. Um, and so when we, uh, you know, first started talking about the project that he was interested in, it was really clear that it was going to be a win-win. It was going to work for his operation but it was really going to be great for wildlife as well. And it wasn't something that, it wasn't my idea, it was his idea. So, so landowners are bringing these beneficial projects to, to NRCS to, to get some technical assistance and to get some financial assistance in some cases. Um, but after, after all of the, um, you know, through the process, um, he explained, you know, what his goals were, and so I listened to his suggestions, and then he in turn listened to my suggestions and recommendations on, on ways that we could maybe um, to to help provide maybe some extra cover for wildlife in this area, and and he saw the value in that also, um, and so then at, by the end of the um, you know the end of the project after things had all been implemented, he. Um, he called me up. He's like, are you going to be in the office? I was like, oh yeah, come on by. I figured he would, um, he wanted me to like print him out something because he didn't have an email. And uh, I, he walks in the door and it's like, I was like, okay, what do you need? He's like, oh, nothing. I just, I wanted to make sure that you were here so I, I could thank you in person for all of your assistance. And I mean, that was like a really, um, I think, showed the value of the relationship that we had and the trust I, that he had and, and, the, and the value he had with the, uh, just the, the um, working relationship that we had. And, and since that time, he's, he's actually done a couple other projects with us as well. Um, and so I think that those, those relationships are really um, gonna be the key 
to successful um, work in the future on working lands. And there's a lot of value in that um, because especially right now, um, NRCS has, uh, you know, a lot of extra fun or a lot of um, increased funding opportunities. Um, and there's a lot of other funding opportunities through other federal programs as well. And so being able to have those relationships, develop partnerships, whether it's with SWCDs, um, OWEB, play, or groups like Sustainable Northwest, um, just finding those relationships, establishing those, and then that leads to increased funding opportunities. Um, and as Debbie is going to describe, um, having a more strategic approach to addressing some of the climate resiliency priorities that we have. Thank you, Hillary. And um, some of you met Hillary on one of our field trips, and I just, she has been such a rock star in this position uh, and really single handedly positioned us uh, to get so much work done because of how good she's been at working with landowners. Because the reality is that you work with one landowner, if they have a good experience, they're the ones that are going to tell other landowners um, and, and people are more willing to approach us or let us on their property, talk about possibilities. So thank you so much, Hillary. Uh, advance this slide. There we go. Oops. So again, you know, this is, this is work we're doing. We've always been good at collaboration. We've always had kind of the, the DNA kind of in our field folks where we, you know, we're working with others. You know, we talk to you all all the time about how we have to get habitat work done and yet we don't own most of the habitat. So, so it's, you know, in one hand you go, well, what's different? Isn't that what y'all do anyway? What we're really thinking about is first of all, kind of how do we really think about it more from a climate perspective? Like how are things changing on the ground for species and for these folks that we can be anticipating needs? So not just the day-to-day -day kind of opportunities, but be forward thinking about mm -hmm. kind of, you know, you, you heard yesterday at the pond, the, the different types of, of ability of species to move, right? in the face of a changing climate. So, so kind of how we start anticipating more of this, not only anticipating species needs, but anticipating people needs. Um, and, you know, we have a lot of great tools for prioritizing. We know a lot about changing climate and how it's going to impact species. Um, and we're doing a lot in terms of kind of bringing focused attention and, and federal funds to specific working land areas like the Rogue and the Klamath, the Malawa, uh, we're doing, you know, the corridor uh, prioritization, you know, all of these tools, I think that will inform those conversations. And then you've got this added layer that you're hearing more and more about in terms of carbon sequestration, which is, you know, also central to our climate policy. So again, you know, the, the additional sliver is more of a strategic look at the needs, more of a you know, now is the time to be building relationships because they take it takes time to to really build the kind of relationships where you can think at a landscape level and partner at more of a landscape level to to not only meet kind of the people needs but also build in these co benefits for wildlife. And so, uh, you know. For some of us, again, we, we've always been an agency that was focused on partnership and collaboration. What we're really thinking more about these days is um, kind of a mind, mind, mindset shift, a, a, a doubling down on this idea of partnerships. Um, and, you know, again, trying to really be mindful of, of the people part of needs. Um, as we think about climate, and we think that's going to be critical to the long-term success of meeting our wildlife needs. So the questions that we're asking ourselves is, you know, how do we bring more attention to this work, especially at kind of a landscape scale? How do we, um, where are we, where are we having success? What's already working for us? Um, and what would it look like to take things to scale? 
And then lastly, what's keeping us from doing more? You know, are are we putting our resources in the right place to build those relationships? Um, are we sitting down with the right folks to understand the pressures that might be on some of these working lands? Um, and you know, giving it and more time lastly, and energy to understand from doing those more? circumstances. You know, are, are uh, we putting our resources and, um, in the right place you know, where, where might we bring more resources? Um, because we all of this is expensive. And, you know, when you're talking private lands, you know, it's, it's one thing for us to show up and know what wildlife need and how those private lands can help to even help them design the ideas. But they're private lands. I mean, if, if there's any kind of improvement that's going to happen, it is going to cost money. And so, you know, how how are we helping to connect with resources um, and um, really, you know, working side by side with these landowners? So this is this is why we wanted to bring it to you today, because th this is where kind of your leadership um, team and and your field folks, we're, we're all kind of thinking about the long term with this lens and um, asking ourselves how we're going to do more. Any questions, thoughts? Commissioner Bill Brink. Thank you, Chair Wall. Uh, yeah, just uh, listening to uh, Nick and and uh, Hillary reminded me of uh, some conversations I've had with uh, Walt Van Dyke. He's a retired uh, biologist, wildlife biologist over in Ontario, and he said one of the best pieces of advice he ever got when he was, you know, young, young in his career was show the patch. You know, the idea from Jeffy Patch, show the patch. He said it wasn't always easy. He said, uh, you know, his boss would find out that the ODFW got raked over the coals of a cattleman's meeting. He'd say, well, I want you to be there at the next meeting. He said, you know, like getting thrown into the lion's den. But he says, overall, he said, that's where they built the relationships, the communication. Yeah. Uh, he said, you know, it was the best advice he got. So it's just, you know, it's good to hear that. that that's still working and it always will. Go ahead. All right, Vice Chair. Of course, I feel like this whole presentation was for me to be so excited. <laughs> Is everybody here excited? Come on. <laughs> yeah, <who do> you? <laughs> um, I feel like, um, you know, I feel like especially our communities that are on uh, the other side of the mountain, the east side, have been living in what I would call the Old Testament the last several years uh, between drought, fire, plague, grasshoppers, predation, finances. It goes on and on. Um, there could be no better time for ODF and W to seriously take this on as a priority um, and not just for the benefit of working lands and families, but you know, we're about to hear the mule deer update. Um, Josh Smith, I'm not calling you Josh mule deer, which is what I've started to do with people is I can't remember anyone's name. Um, look at uh, what's happening to our mule deer because of the conditions of our range. Um, there's so many reasons for us to do this work. Um, the NRCS uh, is really going to be able to make a big investment in Oregon. Some of their programs, even though NRCS has 50 million programs, there, there's work that needs to be done to get those programs to fit what's going on today. So, I mean, I'm incredibly excited about this. Um, and uh, I, I, I just, I hope we can meaningfully connect. I also think it would be good for the state. I feel like we've lost uh, an ethic as a state of being an incredible state with our natural resources, whether it's our coast, our uh, range, our cascades, our, you know, we we need to highlight our natural resources of the state and get people behind it again. Okay, I'll stop. Like an infomercial. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to add just a couple of things from the the same perspective, but from the west side because it's Sorry. these things are a little. <laughs> <laughs> well, these this is I think an incredibly important thing to look at, and I applaud the the work that. ODF and W is doing to be more involved in this particular arena. Um, the way I have looked at this is 
the the land base left for ag and the land base left for natural resources for habitat is the same thing in this state. Ranches and farmers are aging out and the ranches can become houses, which we all need, or they can stay ranches. And our experience, my family's experience on the South Coast with our ranch and a lot of other ranches in the area has been exceptional with NRCS and, and US Fish bringing resources to do the two sides together, to recognize that the land base for ag and the land base for habitat is the same thing. We have our public lands, but that's that's what we have. But if you look at the rest of the state, most of the habitat is on timberland, ag land, which I kind of lumped together. And I think it's it's perfect timing, as Commissioner Hatfield Hyde has said, is to have ODF and W also there. And in some parts of the state, it's it's scattered. There, sometimes ODF and W has been right there in these projects. But with NRCS's resources and their work for years with ranchers and ag, and with now OAHP, with OWEB, their Oregon Ag Heritage mm -hmm. Program, being able to protect these chunks of ag land at just the time their ranchers are aging out and we're starting to lose these pretty fast, this is the time. And the things that can be accomplished on both sides are pretty phenomenal if we will actually work together and recognize where that it has to work on both sides and it can. That's the magic of it. The one thing I want to add is that we all need to be looking for, and that is the missing piece, and this will fill some of it. The missing piece that I've seen for years in this arena is we don't have very many young people who have a foot deep, deep, deep in conservation and just as deep in ag who know how to put these things together. So it's a piece to just think about for going forward. But my hat's off to the agency for moving so fully into this arena. <clears throat> Very good. And again, you know, this is, uh, we're, we're hoping that this conversation we have at this with you can culminate in this round table in December and we bring partners in and, and we talk about how do we make this happen? I mean, we're going to be thinking as a leadership team, but we are, we're seeing a role for the commission to engage in that conversation uh, during the round table in December. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Yes. Thanks, Debbie. Uh, next up, commissioners, we'll have an update on our mule deer plan revision. We've got Dr. Don Whitaker, uh, Josh Smith, and Brian Wolfer coming up. Josh. Good morning, Chair Wall, Vice <laughs> Chair Atfeld Hyde, Director Melcher, members of the Commission. Uh, I'm Brian Wolfer. I'm the Deputy Administrator in our Wildlife Division. Uh, as the Director mentioned, I have with me today Dr. Don Whitaker, our Ungulate Coordinator, and Josh Smith, uh, our Mule Deer Coordinator. And we're here to to bring to talk to you uh, in an informational setting about the Mule Deer Management Plan revision process and give you an update on that process. Uh, as you know, mule deer have been declining uh, in Oregon for for a number of decades, and that's been of concern to us and concern to a lot of our constituents. It's not unique to Oregon. It's something that we see going on uh, across the mule deer range. And so we've been planning for a while on, on how we get the information we need to take a new approach to mule deer management. And so this is a management plan revision. This is not an update or a tweak, but us saying, how do we take a new approach to mule deer management? Because we really do want to see an improvement to mule deer populations and turn around this, this long-term trajectory. So today you're going to hear um, an update on the process that we've undertaken to date and what that public engagement has been. Uh, we'll talk briefly about some of the key components and issues. Um, this is a 
this is a big topic and a lot of issues, and we're not going to have time to touch on all of them, but we're going to touch on some of those key components and issues that are in our draft plan um, as of right now. And then we'll speak briefly on some of the summary of the feedback that we're hearing from constituents and, and what we're doing with that, and then the next steps uh, on the plan. And so with that, I'm going to pass the clicker over here to Dr. Whitaker and Thank you, Brian. Um, for the record, I'm Don Whitaker. I'm the Angular coordinator in our Salem headquarters for ODFW. I want to start by pointing out that um, we're now two years into this revision process. It's been kind of a big lift because it had been a while since it had been revised. Um, the revision team, uh, and it has been a team effort, we, we basically began with some internal scoping and a and development of subject or topic areas that we wanted to uh, address in the plan. Um, we provided our scoping subjects out to our field for their evaluation. Those are kind of the boots in the ground. They're, they get just as many of the issues and comments as everybody else does. We also shared this information with our sports group leaders very early on in our process. Um, these final sections or or topics essentially became the chapters within this plan um, because the plan also serves a little bit as a historical document for the department um, we started it with some updates on the historical information and and updates to biology and science and ecology and management of, of mule deer um, for those uh, those were followed by sections focusing on mule deer management by gross or high level section. In those sections, each of those sections included um, associated issues and strategies that we felt were uh, doable by the department in this plan. For this plan, we, we used a new process, a new revision process. Um, we felt that if we release the sections topics I keep up with the computer yeah <laughs> thank you um, we we began writing the sections and completing these sections or topics or chapters and as we completed drafts of those we released those to uh, the public for their feedback um, we felt that this might make it easier for people to focus on each of the topics individually and give them a little bit more time to look at those and provide our comments as opposed to waiting and throwing a 200 page document out there and saying we want your input on every single page of it. We're hoping for a little bit more detailed work on that. As we had a few of those sections completed, anywhere from three to four sections at a time, we provided a public webinar. Um, these webinars were presented by the, the primary authors of each of those sections. And following the, the webinar, um, there was direct interaction with the public via the, the comments. And we tried to address as many of the comments that we would have received prior to the webinar and even during the webinar um, to try to keep that communication link going. After all five of the webinars were uh, completed, we compiled all of the sections into one combined document. During that process, we extracted the issues and strategies for those management sections and compiled those into one complete final uh, chapter or subject area of the plan. This was again posted out, for, presented to the public for the review of a full comment or a full document so they could look at how, uh, as we all know, many of these individual subjects interact with each other. So, so we put it all together, condensed all the issues and strategies and, and gave people additional time to look at those. Um, following that posting, we went around the state for three public meetings, presented a synopsis of, of that complete document at those public meetings, which were actually fairly well attended. Um, and again, there was direct interaction with the public, Q&A, feedback. We took good notes and we had re note recorders there so that we incorporated all of that communication and all of that 
comments and suggestions directly that we could evaluate in our revision process. It's important to note that we have um, solicited feedback and comment from our public from the very start of this process. Two years we've been looking for that impact or that input, uh, starting with our sports group leaders uh, clear back in February of 2022. We've provided multiple avenues or opportunities to get that feedback, including uh, a direct link on our website with a fillable form that comes direct to uh, an email that we all could uh, view and look at to um, emails directly to the department. Uh, Josh and I and Brian have all had multiple conversations and personal meetings and phone calls with folks asking questions, providing input. We're keeping track of all of that. Uh, some of the stuff that we received early did affect the later writing. So we have been paying attention to this information. We've been looking at it. We've been reading it as we as it comes in and we're currently in the process of evaluating the condensed combined version of all of our communications and subjects and comments to see what and where and how we can incorporate all of that into the the revision of the complete document a key theme throughout much of the draft plan is the point that the carrying capacity for mule deer on Oregon's mule deer landscape has declined significantly over the last three or four decades. Um, the effects of climate change, um, changing public and private land management processes and strategies and dynamics, and an increasing human population on the Oregon mule deer landscape are all interacting together to affect mule deer populations, uh, for the most part, in a less than desirable direction. Most important issue in all of these interactions is its effect on nutrition. We have a lot of data that says even in our best habitats, our nutrition available for mule deer may not be what they need. And this is leading to declines in everything from reproduction and survival to increases in such things as risk of contracting diseases and increasing predation rates that we observe on that landscape. Um, so this is a big message. This is a big issue for us. And this interacts with a number of the other sections in that chapter or in that document. With that, I'd like to turn things over to Josh for some further discussion of some of these key components and issues that we've seen and, and we're coming up to. Oops, too fast, too far. There we go. Thank you, Don. For the record, I am Josh Smith, uh, the ODFW Mule Deer Coordinator at La Grand Oregon. And in addition to some of the habitat work and, and, and nutritional component that Don was referencing there, uh, one of the other big themes um, and key components of this management plan was our ability to define herd range boundaries. And although the, the methodology was presented outside of the plan, that's in a technical report, but uh, ultimately defining those is going to really direct a lot of what we do and, and what I'm going to talk about in the next few slides, but what we are proposing in this new draft management plan. And I want to be clear that when we talk about herd ranges, what we are referring to is an area that represents the year-round biological needs of a mule deer population. <clears throat> so encompassing those summer range habitats, those winter range habitats, as well as those migratory pathways that we know are critical for mule deer to meet their life history needs. And this really represents a fundamental shift at the scale, uh, really switching to a more appropriate biological scale for mule deer management in the state. The concept that mule deer move between different wildlife management units uh, is, is nothing new. We've known this going back years and years into the 50s and 60s. But really from 2005 to 2019, ODFW really began to take a look at this at a population scale. <clears throat> this result, the result of collaring more than 1400 mule deer was the identification of 22 unique herd ranges across uh, Western or Eastern Oregon, excuse me. Essentially meaning there are 22 distinct herd ranges in the state. Um, 
identifying these biological boundaries really sets the stage to guide our monitoring efforts, our management strategies, and ultimately aid in determining the impact of uh, these efforts on uh, mule deer population performance. So, having identified those herd range boundaries, um, you know, from a management perspective, it is imperative now that we align um, both our harvest management practices as well as our monitoring efforts to match the biology of mule deer. Um, this figure on the right up here um, kind of depicts those 22 herd ranges um, resulting from that powering effort that I mentioned in the previous slide. And uh, I think you can kind of see those represented kind of by the purple outlines. And then those smaller gray areas represent our, our historical wildlife management unit boundaries. <clears throat> what becomes apparent really as you look at this map uh, is that there are some areas where our traditional wildlife management unit structure actually aligns pretty well with our herd range boundaries. Or areas at least where our wildlife management units are contained within larger herd range boundaries. And for instance, you know, this area up here in the northeast, uh, all those herd ranges essentially, with the exception of one that the Catherine Creek unit kind of gets split, but most of those are, are, are contained within two larger herd range boundaries. So um, makes makes uh, our management activities a little bit easier. However, um, some areas around the central blues here, uh, if you start looking at wildlife management units like the Ochico's here and Silby's unit, wildlife management unit, what you actually see is we have three distinct herds coming into those wildlife management units. So we're kind of harvesting, you know, from three different um, populations there. Um, so we do have some mismatch on, on our, our harvest management structure. Um, what we are proposing is modifying the scale of, of both our data collection efforts, as well as a reallocation of our harvest management units to match the best available science and the biology of mule deer. Um, and to be clear, we are not proposing uh, herd range specific uh, or herd range scale hunts, but rather a reallocation of harvest unit boundaries where they would be contained within those larger um, herd range boundaries. And just, you know, as an example, under our current wildlife management system, uh, there's approximately 70% of our deer are in different areas when we hunt them versus when we count them. And before I start talking about the management objective structure, I, I just want to reiterate something that Brian said. We, we all want more mule deer on the landscape. I think everyone in this room, and certainly we as an agency, are not satisfied, and our constituents are not satisfied with current mule deer population trends. We want to see those increasing in eastern Oregon and, quite frankly, around the western United States as well. Having said that, similar to our harvest management and monitoring efforts, we also need to align our, our management objective structure to match what the data is telling us. So what I mean by that is setting MOs at the herd range scale as well, and really aligning everything we do uh, with the biology of the species. And there are two really important things from a population perspective when you, when you start thinking about populations, and that is abundance and growth rate. Um, consequently, we are proposing uh, a four-tiered management objective structure that takes both of those into account. If you can see, I think everyone has that, but one of the key aspects of this new structure that we're proposing is, is uh, this table here, and there's kind of the two rows, the top row there represents uh, population abundance, and that bottom row represents uh, a five-year average annual growth rate. And as you go across these tiers, that tier one, represents kind of our, our lowest level for abundance. That would be an area of heightened concern. Populations at that level with data would indicate that they could and probably should be at a higher level than that. Something is going on. So we would assign those anything at or below that level would get this tier one abundance designation. And as those populations begin to increase, we go from you know one anywhere from one to 25%, we get that tier two designation and so on, up to that tier four designation that is 50% or above that tier one uh, category. And when we set these numbers for these, one thing we did want, want to look at is thinking about what might be attainable over a 20 year time frame. So we're really trying to set the, the temporal scale over which we're wanting to evaluate 
some of these management actions. And again, taking into account that growth rate, what is what it would be biologically attainable over that 20 year time frame. Um, that second row there represents our again our five year growth rate on average, and that goes from the tier one kind of represents those moderate to large scale decreases that we're seeing. So if we're seeing those, those get a, that tier one designation and they move up to more stable to actually those more moderate to, to large scale increase and get those tier four designations. Um, the second aspect of this is this scoring matrix you see down at the bottom. The idea would be that for every year we could go in, assess where that, dip, where that herd range falls on that population tier, or the, the abundance tier, as well as the growth rate, and then kind of crosswalk this out and give it, um, assign it one of these concern lengths, either high, medium, uh, low, or least concern on this, uh, on this scoring matrix here. And if you look at that map to the right, uh, you can see these are from our 2023 population estimates. Uh, we have currently had, or at least as of 2023, had five of those units are in high concern category and the rest are in that medium concern category. So we do still have a lot of concern for mule deer populations uh, across the state. And a couple of things just on this system here. Uh, the first, it really gives us the ability to better assess management actions um, and how those are affecting population performance. Honestly, it's probably unlikely that some of these populations that have been experiencing these 10%, 8%, 9% annual declines, they're not going to turn around in the next few years. But well, what this does give us the ability to do is look at how those management actions may be slowing that decline and eventually stabilize and start to increasing that growth rate. And ultimately, you you have to have positive growth rates to get more mule deer on the landscape. We know that. And so this kind of gives us a finer scale, the ability to more fine scale look at those and how those management actions might be influencing population performance. Um, the other thing, uh, it gives us an objective measure to allocate limited resources. You know, Debbie was talking about um, how much it costs to do this work within RCS on, on private lands. I mean, it costs just as much to do this for mule deer habitat as well. Um, so in, in you know, finite budgets and that sort of thing, this, this gives us a way to objectively prioritize where we may need to, to be focusing our, our management activities. Um, I guess lastly on this, we are, you know, really, we, we recognize this is a new concept. Um, we, we do want to, you know, really commit to reevaluating this a, on, on that formal five-year basis, but we will be evaluating this on an annual basis. We will be looking at this every year to see how the system is working and how our populations are doing. And again, we recognize that these herd ranges are, are a new concept in general. Uh, you know, I actually, as an agency and 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 as constituents, uh, we just don't have that 60 plus year history of data and and biology and, and going out and having that information like we do for a wildlife management unit scale currently. Um, so what we've tried to do uh, is provide these short kind of three to four page um, herd range reports uh, to, to allow uh, people to kind of kind of get caught up and provide some context to this new wildlife man or this, this new herd range structure. Um, so first of all, what we've done is we have this map inset, and this is this is included in the wild in the in the mule deer plan. Uh, we have this inset map that kind of spatially depicts where that herd range is on the landscape. And then below that, we actually give some writing that illustrates what historical wildlife management units were incorporated in that, as well as some breakdown on general things like land ownership, how much is public, how much is private, what is, uh, you know, which uh, federal agency may own that BLM, Forest Service, and that sort of thing. And this is not included on this. I, this is really pared down just to show some, some high-level stuff here. We also provide some population-level statistics going back several years, things like post-harvest abundance, depicting those tiers. You can kind of see there's a little a little bit difficult in that, that map, that figure there, but uh, they are there. Also the average annual growth rate across time. And we've got a couple other things like our buck ratios, our bond to doe ratios are depicted in those as well. I will say not depicted in this slide, but incorporated in the other, in the write-ups in the plan. Uh, we do provide that scoring matrix from that previous table, illustrating where that population is at the current time. Um, and from the previous slide, um, this, 
bird range depicted here that mid Columbia is actually in the, the medium concern category. Um, lastly, we provide this table here. You can kind of see at the bottom right uh, that really describes some of the management priorities that we have for that herd range, as well as some specific actions we are pro proposing uh, to improve conditions on the ground for mule deer. And again, these are herd range specific and, and you know, for, for each herd range. And I, I do want to point out too that this also is not uh, an exhaustive list for this herd range. I simply picked a few out to just illustrate um, how those, those look in, in the mule deer plan. And I think actually with that, I can uh, turn it back over to Brian. Thanks, Josh. So throughout this process, we've had a lot of great feedback and engagement. There's a lot of interest in mule deer. Um, for me, you, you heard a little bit from Don about the webinar process, and this has been uh, kind of new for us in releasing this plan in very draft chapter to let people look at those and provide feedback is kind of a new approach. It's been kind of neat to see how the webinars work. Um, as we got to the later webinars, webinars like four and five, you would see the views on the earlier webinars jump up around the release um, of those later webinars. So there was definitely the opportunity for people that weren't engaged at the beginning to come back and binge watch and catch up. And that's a that's a pretty unique thing that we've not had the opportunities to do before. And um, some of those webinars are up around 700 plus views of um, people checking into those webinars. We've got over 150 comments that we're dealing with, as well as what we've learned from the individual conversations with folks and from our in-person public meetings. And so this really was a draft, and now we're going back and we're um, looking at comments and trying to address comments. So there's some some general uh, kind of comment areas that, that I'm gonna highlight that, that we're hearing from. Um, one is around harvest management. So, when we look at how we changed our harvest management with mule deer, of course, we have some of the comments of, I'd like more opportunity to hunt. I give up opportunity to hunt on the other hand for uh, hunting where there's more mature bucks or something like that. Uh, we're really gonna be taking another look at some of the human dimensions work that we did as part of the big game review and make sure that this um, kind of breakdown of opportunity that we're looking at fits within that human dimensions work and provides something for the variety of range of why people hunt. There's a lot of question around the timeline, and I think we can do more to clarify what that timeline would be. And so once this plan's ad adopted and we've got those kind of direction and marching orders of how we're going to move forward, then we're going to develop that, that timeline to implement changes. Uh, and and it can't happen for 2025, there's just not enough time, but 2026 is our target to implement changes to hunt structure to fit within uh, this herd range. That gives us the chance for more public engagement through the regulation process. And so we would be going through our public meetings um, once we develop the resources and the maps and help people understand, and then that would be coming forward in, in 2025 as part of the regs package. And so I think we can do some things to clarify that uh, this draft plan has a section on predation, and we've gotten a lot of um, comments back on that. So, so within that plan, uh, we acknowledge that there's a relationship between predator and prey, and mule deer are prey species. And so, we we talk about when there's evidence and data that shows that predation uh, is a is a big factor in what's happening to the mule deer population. That that we can address that predation and really consistent with those individual species plans. We have cougar plan, a wolf plan. We have these species plans that, that do um, provide for changes in management of those when there's impacts to other species. But we're really relying on evidence and data to support that. So we've got some of the comments that are outside the scope of this process or outside the commission authority, like why we want to see hound hunting allowed for cougars, which is not within your authority to do or our authority to do. Um, and and so we, we're, we're looking at those, but we're also getting those questions about, well, 
did you write this too narrow when you look at the data and and the evidence that there's a predation impact? And so we're going back and really looking at that section, comparing it to the to those individual species management plans, making sure that we're consistent there, making sure that this is not you know, outside of what those plans allow for. So we have consistency across our plans, um, but also making sure that if some of the research that we're currently doing, looking at that relationship between nutrition and predation, if we have results there that support um, the need to make some changes to predator management, do does this plan provide that flexibility and would that be a, a future action that we might bring forward? Um, so we're taking a look at that. We've heard a fair bit about the management objectives. Um, as Josh pointed out, moving from just a number, um, a single static number to being able to evaluate with a tiered system and looking at that change over time and what that population is doing going up or going down, that's been pretty widely supported. And, and a lot of folks appreciate that because having a number doesn't tell you the whole story. Was that number going up and how fast is it going down and how fast is the critical component? And so that's been positive. There's been the questions about um, clarity on how those tiers were developed, um, maybe suggestions for more tiers, and, and some concern that in combination, uh, those numbers are, are less than in the past. And so we're taking a hard look at those comments. Um, I will say that these tiers I view as pretty aspirational. They're, they're what we think we could achieve in a given period of time if we could really turn things around and get to some of these positive growth rates, and it's not gonna be easy to do. But we also recognize that this is going to be incremental and reversing the trends in mule deer aren't gonna happen overnight. And so what's that 20 year window was what we started out to. And so I think the challenge for us right now is looking at how we don't lose sight of where we were in the 80s and 90s, where we wanted to be in the 80s and 90s, but also have have a have a structure that can communicate to the public of what we think is possible and what our goal is, um, so that they know what to expect from us and what to expect from our management. And so we're trying to look at how we don't lose the past, um, but still have a, a management objective that's really meaningful today. And, and accounts for that incremental change that we're gonna see as we turn things around. Uh, we, we've had some, some comments on habitat and nutrition, you know, everywhere from you have too much focus on habitat and nutrition to this really is the key um, and we wanna see more here. And so I'm gonna talk about this in relationship to a uh, another larger subject, which is specificity in the plan. How much specifics do we have? And so this plan is an overarching plan. It covers all the mule deer issues across Eastern Oregon that we've identified. And those issues that we're seeing in Bend with development are very different than what we're seeing in the Blue Mountains of Northeast Oregon or in the high desert country of Southeast Oregon. And so as Josh said, we, we have these herd range reports that really boils down which parts of the plan we see as relevant to these herd ranges. Um, but from the feedback we're getting, we recognize that um, we're gonna have to take that a step further um, and really focus on actions that we're gonna do over the next defined time period, whether that's two years, three years, um, but really either modify those herd range reports or develop a, a secondary implementation plan that really highlights what those short-term actions are that we're gonna focus on, what our goals on are, and provide us that adaptive management tool. Um, and so those herd range reports would not be adopted into rule with the plan. They would be flexible and allow us to provide updates and um, let the public know, here's our check-in, here's, here's what we've accomplished in the last two or three years. Here's that change in what we know about this herd range and what we're gonna focus on next and what our goals are next. And so we really want those to be adaptive. And so from that feedback we've gotten, we're taking a hard look at how we improve that, that piece of it. And so with that, our, our next steps in this process as I mentioned, the team is really digging into these comments and really looking at how we can incorporate them, where we can incorporate them. But then there's 
and and we're we have folks clamoring to see the results of that and so we're striving to get that out a revival <laughs> we're also going to be doing some real targeted outreach with some of the groups and individuals that have really provided some some meaningful comment that we're trying to address and talk through how we address those and in those cases where we can't like why we couldn't and so we're going to have a couple month time period a two month time period to really do some more of that outreach uh, and have those conversations uh, leading up to this plan coming for the before the commission in June. So we're looking at that June 14th meeting in Klamath Falls to bring the plan forward. And so that concludes what we what we had to share with you today. Um, we're available to take questions if you have any. Commissioner King and then Commissioner Lamhart. Thank you, Chairwell. Thank you, gents, for your report. And I, I was able to see at least some of the webinars. Um, my question is that maybe maybe this comes to us in June more, but it's all to me. It's almost like looking at some of the spring Chinook data. I mean, it's just this downward trend that's depressing. Um, and and when you see like the, it's either moderate or high severity. Like for the whole eastern half of the state, it's either yellow or red. There's no green out there. <laughs> it's very little good news. So my question is, and do we have a sense yet? Like, how bad is it? Like, are, are we getting to the point where we're going to have to start limiting hunting? Is it going to be like, you know, a once in a lifetime tag, like what we've got with, you know, the bighorn sheep? You know, I, what what exactly, like specifically what is happening? Like, I'm understanding like they're being squeezed on both ends of their range. I understand, you know, like it's got the Swiss cheese model of things lining up this in badly for them there's it's a multitude it's not a single issue it's really complex i understand that but um when you think about what you're talking about the temporal timeline it's going to be 20 years so and it, it, we're going to if we get any success it's going to be incremental like uh, when do we sort of say like you know you can't hunt this species because xyz well is there going to be some kind of clarity on that is my question so chair wall commissioner king um <laughs> yeah, there, there's there's some very interesting things that we're learning as we're developing herd range specific models and working with some experts um, that we've contracted to do that. And so, while while our management objectives are very aspirational and give us something that is going to be a reach to reach for, uh, we do we do have some some spots that are positive. We have some herds that are increasing with five year average increases of two to 3% a year in some places. And so I think, I think if we can keep that up, if we can keep doing the things that we're doing in those herds, we're going to see within a five year time period, some of those change to the light green, which, which I view as we don't have to upset the apple cart. We have to keep up the good things we're doing, which differentiates that from um, those those few herds that are seeing an eight or nine percent uh, annual decrease over the last five years, and and that becomes much more of a drastic change in in how we're addressing those, what we're doing with habitat and with other things. And so, we we intentionally set what we what we wanted to be a fairly high bar to be a reach, um, and not say we're satisfied with some of these herds that are that have been increasing over the last five years in terms of hunting um we've made a lot of those cuts and and have become very conservative as it comes to antlerless hunting because of how that impacts overall population um when we look at our buck hunting we we've been making cuts to that through time and some pretty drastic cuts to fit what's available in the population we've taken some look at and our buck ratios and our herds with the buck ratio piece um, to see if we can see any impact on the on impacts to uh, reproduction. And so we know that for us maintaining a three tiered system, um, you can have single digit buck ratios and get your reproduction done. That's what past history tells us. That's what management tells us. But even now we've taken that look at, okay, so herds that are at 12 bucks per hundred, 
Um, those should have twice the bucks they need to get the reproduction done. We're we're hunting for lack of a better term that that surplus of bucks. Um, but we we've, we've taken a look at how that compares to herds that are at 25 bucks per hundred, and we're not seeing any difference in in uh, fawn reproduction. And so that that buck harvest, we still need to be conservative and ensure that we have enough. Um, but we've become pretty conservative over time, and I think that's going to continue. Um, if herds continue to drop, we're going to continue to see declines in hunting opportunity. I see if anybody else on the panel wants to add to that. Well, um, Commissioner King or Chair Wall, Commissioner King, I would add that you're right. It does indeed appear a very, very dramatic in what the populations have done and what our harvest has done. There's no, there's no getting around that. But I think it's also worth pointing out that at the current level where our mealier populations are and where our harvest rates are, we are a long, long, long way from stopping hunting. And I think that's an important message. The, hunting and harvest and the utilization of that resource has declined as the populations have declined. But we're still, you know, 200,000 mule deer. We're still in good shape. We're just not where we were 40 years ago. And I think that's an important part of the message that, you know, honestly, we may not do a very good job of sometimes. So we're a long ways from the level of doom and gloom that might be portrayed given what we're seeing in our mule deer on the landscape. And if we get a few more longer term years, like we've had the last couple of moisture years on our, our country out there, we could indeed start seeing some of these positive increases that we're going. We're, we're not where we want to be, but we're not where we're, we got to shut things down. We're a long ways from there. And we're in a position where we can stop it, turn it, hopefully start getting things going up in a more favorable di direction. Okay. Thank you for explaining. Thank you. Yep. Thank, you. <clears throat> thank you, Chair Wall. Um, and as, uh, this is a public thank you. So um, as Brian knows, I, I've taken a very strong interest in the development of this plan, um, had multiple conversations with him mm -hmm. and st other staff, but um, I think we've done a really good process. Two years is is a long time, but because of this webinar process of rolling out chapters in in various periods of time and having a really good discussion about that, I I believe that that has really helped uh, the public and the interest groups that are interested in this plan understand what is happening as both of these uh, processes, the webinars and the public meetings have rolled out. So strong supporter of that. The, the issue that I had was now that we're getting ink to paper, um, I, I'm, now people are starting to see, okay, here's here's what's being proposed, and they still have some questions. And so um, I very much appreciate Chair Wall, uh, you and staff uh, agreeing to slow the process down a little bit now and moving the commission decision to June uh, so that's now that we're getting ink on paper and really starting to folks to start to look at what does this mean? How does this mean? I have a question here. Um, I think uh, from what I've heard, the groups are very appreciative of that now. And so I just want to thank staff for slowing the process down now so that we, when we get to June, I'm hoping, fingers crossed, that the plan is delivered to the commission as a draft that the interest groups come in and say, we it's not perfect, um, but we can live with it. And we feel we feel good about being involved in the process. Staff heard us, staff listened to us, and we feel good about the process so that the commission can say, yep, we've done our, our due diligence here. We've got a plan, um, we'll review it every five years, we'll continue to look at things, and that we'll have a good, a good plan. So I wanna thank staff and Chair Wall for you agreeing to uh, postpone this or slow it down just a little bit so we have the final will be in June now instead of earlier. So I want to thank you for that. Welcome. 
So when you see the agenda for June, you might not still be thanking them. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Right here. There's a dessert. Okay, you're, we're going to be exhausted June by the time I drag you guys to the county, too. we have worn out in more ways than one. Um, uh, I, I uh, would uh, absolutely agree with Commissioner Labhart. Thank you, Chair Wall, for slowing this process down. I think we heard that um, from the stakeholders. They just need a little bit more time to absorb. Um, I also want to say I I love Brian your term of people who are binge watching the meal clear uh, <laughs> webinars. Gotta love you that. are my people. Whoever you are out there, <laughs> you binge watchers of the meal deer uh, chapters unfolding. I guess a concern, you know, in talking to stakeholders about this, um, the. I like this development around the idea of the herd reports, um, which are kind of separate from the plan, being more iterative and maybe a place where we can get at some, what I thought was a, a really meaningful input uh, around you know, people's concern out there and my concern, frankly, about what are we really going to do? What can we really do? Um, and when you think about like nutrition and habitat, especially. So I don't know if there's a way to, as you guys are finishing up, just put a little finer point on that. Uh, I would think that the change, you know, how these herd ranges are cha changing because we have the migration data now and how that's changing the the zones, that's a shift in the way people are looking at stuff, but it also could be an interesting shift in, in looking at where the weak links are in terms of the habitat and what's going on. So getting all of our minds around that. And then of course, getting people uh, falling in love with the idea of us doing something about this. So that's the other thing that I just wanna say, um, Brian, I'll just give it to you. Fix it, fix this. <laughs> We love our mule deer. We are sad. And I appreciate Dr. Whitaker saying, you know, don't, don't get all, don't go, don't get too dramatic. It's okay. But uh, these, these mule deer are precious to our communities and we can feel it when they've been declining and they have been. And you're right with the moisture we got last year. I mean, we had triplets in the desert last year where that doe was about <laughs> falling on her head by the end of mm -hmm. end of that program she's like we got it. it with this but um we we want to turn around here not you know i know we'll never be back to the the 70s or whatever but it, it's we need to do better and we need that's all i'll say that's our objective as well and yep yeah so you fix it too all three of you <laughs> It's on chance. you. Take the responsibility. Do something. We don't just want a dirty, dusty plan on a shelf somewhere. Okay. I have a couple questions. I'm not sure they'll follow up well after those, but they Sorry. are two questions. <laughs> um, one of them is the we heard about egg and the a lot of this often ends up being if we have a problem with mule deer or they're moving in new areas. Egg and timberland, which I again look at it as kind of a whole. Those are the lands we need to look at. Those private lands are, and you talked about who we we did a great job of getting in communication with the sports groups. Did we also, or have we begun those conversations with Ag about where there might be solutions for sure and potentially conflicts, but you know, those are kind of two sides. If we work it right, those are the same thing in some cases. So are we working with ag and timberland as a whole on these issues, especially the habitat and nutrition? So, um, Commissioner Wall, uh, I think that's a really, really good question. And it's a, it's a mixed answer. Um, yes, we are. We do, we spend a lot of time interacting with our landowners um, at the local district level um, and public and private landowners, both. Um, as an example, many of the access and habitat programs, those are focused on, on private landowners. We still have a few remaining uh, 
programs, some of them are almost artifactual now, but we work with them and we assist them and we advise them on this is a good way to do this, this is a bad way to do that. Uh, we we see lots of proposals um, dealing with fencing issues. A lot of the fences on our landscape, many of those are 80, 100 years old and they're not really wildlife friendly. So we're advising, we're providing information. We do all kinds of stuff that on a private and public land. We at uh, almost all levels within agency, within our agency interact with our public land management partners on all of their revision processes, their planning processes, things like that. And a prime example is we will likely be heavily involved in the 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 new try at the Umatilla Wallawa Whitman Malheur Forest Plan revision, which is starting again. And so we're already trying to 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 get into those loops as well. So the communications are started. They're going to occur at multiple levels within our agency and other agencies, our, our partner agencies, and with our landowners. So we will. We're that's where some of our specific strategies are focused just on that point. Thank you. And there's a little bit of difference between herd because there's some different issues in the different herds. And Chair Wall, if I can add to that a little bit. <clears throat> We've been working a lot with landowners over the years, um, but with the with the habitat division um, being stood up, we're seeing some increases in our capacity, and so this is something that that our capacity and ability um, is going to be increasing. And then maybe my last point is with mule deer in particular. There's been some big changes in landowner um, tolerance for mule deer since early in my career, and so when we talk about um, ag producers and others, uh, what people have seen happen to mule deer populations across the landscape and those declines, uh, even in places where there are still some conflict. And, and we do have those places. Uh, a lot of those places we're seeing some increased acceptance and tolerance of mule deer just as a response to what people are seeing on that broader landscape. And so the ability to work with landowners is there. Don't don't mishear me. There are still some places where we have mule deer conflict, but it's not at all like it was um, 40, 50 years ago, 30 years ago. That's useful to know. Thank you. Um, I do have one other question, and it's this. In the old days, it might have been possible that people in your positions could just do one thing. I don't think it was ever that way, but it, if it was ever that way, I think it's gone. And I think that's the message we can take from what Dr. Colbert talked to us about it is that these things are, there are so many layers to these issues and you're in a position to deal with all of those. So when you look at what was presented to us today in this report and, and in Dr. Colbert's report on climate change, and if you look at the director's report, one of the written pieces was about climate change impacts on mule deer and what it's doing. So you're in the very difficult, but it's it is real position of dealing with climate change and ag solutions and and problems conflicts and trying to spend some time just looking at what is happening with mule deer. So can you talk about the climate change part and just a little bit more and how you're trying to incorporate that in? And part of the reason is one more thing I want to mention because I think it ties in. If you look back 20 years at what we did with in the state for coho because that's one of the trends that maybe, at least for now, is going a little bit in the right direction. Um, we have 20 years of OWEB funneling money into restoration on the land, on private lands, to help with the habitat for that. And so we may have the luxury of a little bit of time because we're not dire yet with the mule deer, but it's not great. Um, so how are we looking at climate change and getting some of these private land changes started now, but especially the climate change part. So Chair Wall, there's a number of pieces there that, that maybe I'm going to hit on before I answer your climate change position. You talked about the, the complexity of the roles and the different responsibilities. And so I, I do want to point out that, you know, as our ungulate coordinator, um, Don has a lot on his plate with 
uh, bighorn sheep and Rocky Mountain goat and pronghorn and elk and mule deer and black-tailed deer and Roosevelt elk. And, and so some of our need to really coordinate activities going on at the district level and communicate with district level and put that focus is one of the reasons why we brought on the mule deer coordinator position that Josh is in and, and that's now a permanent position. And so that coordinating work across districts, um, helping districts uh, set up survey protocols within these new herd ranges, some of that focus we're, we now have on mule deer that um, before we, we were spread thin and hard to be um, effective. When it comes to climate, I'm going to ask Josh to speak a little bit to some of what we've learned um, from Starkey Research Forest and some of those changes in climate. But I do want to say um, within the mule deer plan, we can't look at turning around the climate. So the, the weather's going to do what the weather's going to do, and there's other places to address that. But really what we can do is mitigate the effects of that. So as we see changes in nutrition, um, that are happening due to invasive weeds, drought. Um, Josh is going to talk a little bit about senescence period. The question is, how do we increase overall nutrition quality um, to offset some of those impacts? And that's really what our focus is, is what are those land use management actions that um, bring back that shrub component that's so important to deer as opposed to the grass component for the grazers? Um, how do we get that shrub component back? And Josh, you want to speak briefly about some of those changes that we've witnessed in in Northeast? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair Wall. <laughs> um, you know, from some of our research there of Northeastern Oregon, we've really seen some pretty dramatic shifts since the 90s comparing uh, uh, some of our growing seasons. We've seen uh, our green up phase is actually shifting a little bit earlier and actually becoming shortened. So that time when those plants are most nutritious for, for mule deer, well, and, and ungulates and cattle, in fact, mm -hmm. um, that sort of thing. But also, we're also seeing a shift uh, the time they senesce. It's getting, that 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 is quickening, um, actually. So what we've ultimately found is we've lost about a month of our growing season uh, since about the 1990s. So that is pretty dramatic. I have, you know, kind of building off Brian's points, I think uh, a couple of things that we need to do from that are good for mule deer, but and also really kind of address that climate resiliency uh, of this species. Uh, one, we need to keep ensuring that our, our migration corridors are open and free and unobstructed. I mean, that is something, you know, as we see things like interstates cut these things off or, or highways or anthropogenic structures. Um, or whatever, um, these animals are not then able to migrate and, and utilize those, those different habitats at different times of year when they might be more nutritious because of a changing climate. Um, so that's the first thing I would say on that. Second, um, I think we need to, you know, what's good for mule deer is probably good from a climate change perspective. We need to create a mosaic both spatially and temporally on our landscape. Uh, we need to be, you know, we know we get about a 15, 20 year life expectancy for some of these fuel treatments. If a good fire goes through uh, a, a place, these mule deer and elk tend to use that for about 15 to 20 years. And then it reverts back to about what it was pre-burn or pre-treatment or whatever. Um, so really creating that mosaic, again, spatially. So these need to be distributed on the landscape, but also temporally. We need to think about that. And I think if you do both of those things, you kind of get that mosaic, uh, in fact. So, and, you know, secondarily, what that does is, it does create some of these things like fire breaks and, and create it, it stops these devastating wildfires that just end up being a scorched earth dirt mound and where invasive species tend to tend to come back in. So if we create good foundational habitat for mule deer, I think that helps, um, you know, overall just from a, a climate change standpoint, uh, but that migration corridor is, is really a, a key component mm -hmm. of that as well. Thank you. You look like you're about to say something too. Well, that was very helpful. Thank you. You know, I was I was going to add to it. Not only is the Starkey, you know, research group with NODFW doing a lot of stuff, but there's a lot of work being completed around the range of mule deer, and it's getting to the resolution where we're starting to figure out, you know, the plant types and the plant species and all of that stuff, which we can start bringing into our discussions with our land management partners. So it's been a little bit of a slow process as some of the methodologies and technologies have 
uh, evolved, but we're getting to the point where we have a much better idea of what we actually need on that landscape for mule which is very, very helpful yes. for us. And we can bring those into our discussions with our public and our private land manager and partners. And in many cases, there's species that we're learning about that are important that serve multiple roles. One, they're good cover police species. Two, they're good diet species and they're palatable and digestible, and they work as fire breaks. You know, so there's all kinds of things that are coming into the information world that we're trying to keep track of that will help us in all of those discussions. Thank you. Oh, which one was first, Commissioner King? Level twenty first. Okay. Thank you. Um, and my question is largely a segue to what you're already talking about. Um, we, I talk a lot about human dimension and communication. And um, in our last meeting, we, we talked about like essentially visualization of data. And I think in the mule deer plan, there can be a lot of that. Um, and it, and it, can, it touches on to what I, my initial question is like, I understand, at least I understand partially, not to you guys' level, that we're not falling off the cliff quite yet. Like it's, it's definitely a concern. We need to get a handle on it. We need to understand better. But I think we need to message that better. Um, I, th I think we need to come to that human dimension and the communication, which is a different skill set than being a mule deer coordinator. <laughs> okay, I think, I think you know, we need to start to phone a friend and, and, and really kind of get this out there better so that people understand, because I think they kind of don't. Uh, and 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 I think it's it's not something that I think as an agency we've ever done really all that well. We create these big mule deer plans that are 200 pages that some people lead through, some people don't, some people binge watch the webinar, some people don't. But but I mean I think we're we're in a different way of communicating now, and I think we need to kind of move our communication with mule deer plan into that. Um, and I think that directly speaks to what you just touched on, Josh. Like, you guys are bringing in all, all sorts of aspects, and this is a multi-layered thing. As as the Swiss cheese model is lining up, it's not one thing that's hammering in the mule deer. It's a lot. And one of the major things that I think needs to come into this is fire, and our relationship to fire, and the mule deer's relationship to fire, and creating that mosaic landscape that we don't have right now for lots of reasons, whether we're talking about the ag community, the timber community, you know, there's there's so many things in that Swiss cheese model that, that again, we're not explaining well. Um, and, and I think that that would help us a lot and, and getting people understanding what controlled burns are, like, you know, that it's not the scorched earth, terrible thing that, you know, like, <laughs> you know, when we had five fires at once and, you know, no one in Portland could breathe, you know, like we need to explain, no, it's not that. <laughs> We're talking about controlled burns. We're talking about getting back to time immemorial. Like, you know, when people manage the forest in a very different way, because they always were managed, you know, um, and, you know, getting to some of that story and understanding that in many ways, that's what's hammering the mule deer is the, is the monoculture. Um, and so like, you know, with the, and I think, I think communications can help us a lot, not just the hard science and not just a 200 page tone. Um, um, and I think that I, I would like to see at least some aspect of that in quote, the plan. Uh, because there is so much good stuff in there, like the little bits that I've seen, I've not delved as deep as some of the other commissioners, but I have seen quite a bit of it. And it, it really is amazing. It's good, hard work that you guys are doing. I learn every time I look at it, but I, I just don't think it's out there enough. Um, it, like we, we're not projecting your good, hard work um, and knowing what we're doing. So that just would be my comment. And just listening to all of you, like, you know, I get to come to these community, these these commission meetings. You know, I have the privilege of learning and hearing all of this, but most of the world doesn't. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. Thank you for that. That's been one of our challenges for a long time. It continues to be. So, thanks. It's hard to make the horse drink. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Uh, I was going to sit on my hands and. Uh, not bring up the P word, but yeah, anyway, and I, and I know you've heard it funny, predators. Uh, I'm not saying anything you guys haven't heard through all this process. And it's probably 
the biggest concern complaint I have from people that spend a lot of time on the east side. I don't, I, I don't, I don't know that much about it other than you know what everyone tells me from over there. And uh, you know, the uh, I noticed that this uh, the components and issues part of the presentation there talked about the collar data. Now, was that 1,454 animals? Did that include that earlier study where I think from a couple of years ago there was 1,180 or something like that? This was a different. Chair Ball, Commissioner Spilbrink, the numbers as far as the collars that were in that slide were for the collaring effort that began in winter 2014 15. That doesn't include the South Central study for that count, but the South Central study data was included in the herd range delineation process. Uh, we started with that data that Dr. Jackson collected in the South Central Mule Deer study. And I remember the data there was where it had, once it had the mortalities broken down, yes. it was everything was in that 10% or less range, except predation was the like 50% or something like that. So those numbers are pretty consistent still. Um, the, the illegal harvest was, very near the same level as the predator harvest, which was very low near the level of the legal harvest, if I recall correctly. Well, that's Those three that, were the three leaders, and I think they were that's a, that would be a big change. From, I mean, I still have the old report there, and it was it had everything listed, hunting, all that, and then it had predation was like at the 50% level. And so that sounds like a considerable change from I still have that report at home. Uh, I don't have it with me. Really. I don't remember from are, are, are you referencing the central mule deer study specifically? Yes, I, I remember there was 1180 uh yes. collared deer and then there was like the uh, mortality was 400 was and stuff five, and then the cause of mortality was determined in like 268 of them yeah the south central mule deer study was about 500 animals okay. yeah this we can follow on yeah, yeah, yeah we can get that okay day. sounds good anyway anyway uh like I say, that's probably the biggest concern I hear from you know, folks that that are you know hunting mule deer, and uh, just thought I'd ask that question anyway. I like I said, I know I'm not saying that you haven't heard, but uh, that's the biggest concern I hear. Thank you, thank you all. Um, I think we're going to take a five minute break, then we'll finish the director's report, and then move on to a few other agenda items that we have. So five minute break. Is there any chance I could get that? That legislative panel, uh, what Debbie gave. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right yeah, yeah. 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 yeah.
Director Melcher. All right. Thank you, Chair Wall. Well, I'm going to call up uh, Dr. Sean Clements, calling Dr. Clements in the back of the room. And commissioners, we're going to have Sean Clements give you the same presentation that he gave to the legislature recently on an update on our hatchery resilience work, as well as um, its relationship to the 2023 budget note and funding for the, such work. So, Sean, cheers. Uh, Chair Wall, Vice Chair Hatfield Hyde, Director Melcher, and Commissioners, uh, Sean Clamus, Deputy Administrator for Fish Division. Uh, yesterday we were standing up in in uh, Rock Creek Hatchery in the Rockhead building there, and we were talking about um, some of the challenges and moving forward with making a decision about how to um, kind of restore some of the programs there, given the fire in 2020. And I mentioned that the decision about how to move forward there is really embedded within a larger look at our state hatchery system and some of the challenges we're facing there. And it's really around charting a sustainable path for the hatchery system going forward. Uh, so I'm going to share a little bit about that um, initiative with you today. So a little bit of background about our hatchery system in Oregon. We've got 33 facilities that ODFW operates. Um, 14 of those are owned by the state. And those are primarily on the west side here uh, along the coast. Rock Creek Hatchery is one of those. And then there's 18 uh, federally owned facilities. Those are the large purple um, dots in this, in this image. And those were put in place primarily for mitigation. So when the dams were put in the Columbia River, um, the Willamette and the Rogue, the federal government um, was obligated to mitigate for those lost fishery opportunities and lost tribal opportunities. And then we have one in the Deschutes, which is uh, operated, owned by uh, PGE. And it's again, mitigation for the impact of Round Butte Dam on the Deschutes. So these hatcheries together produce about 35 million salmon steelhead a year and about 5 million trout per year. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're important socially, culturally, and economically in Oregon. Um, there's significant economic benefits that accrue to the state from this production. Uh, you heard last night from Kelly how important they are to the tribes um, in terms of keeping connection to, to salmon and steelhead while we're restoring wild runs. And in a lot of cases, we can't fish on those wild runs. So they're really important tribally to be able to maintain that connection. And then just socially, um, I, I see a lot of people behind me that are likely going to be talking about this in public forum, but how important the opportunity the hatcheries provide out to them. And in fact, in, in Oregon, about 70% of the fish that are harvested um, that's kept by anglers, those are from hatcheries. And about 90% uh, of the trout that are harvested in Oregon are from hatcheries. So really important to that harvest opportunity. But that's not to say that uh, maintaining the system is without its challenges. And we got a graphic illustration of one of those challenges yesterday. And fire is just one of those um, things that's, that's occurring here. And since about 2017, uh, when we had the, the fire in the gorge, um, we had to evacuate several facilities. We had to move fish into other hatcheries. We've had fire as a um, kind of a challenge ongoing. 2020 was admittedly the, the biggest single event where we had challenges with our facilities. Rock Creek, Klamath Hatch House burned down. Leeberg, we had. Um, had some loss of facilities, Minto in the North Santium, um, as well as uh, on the coast, we got close to losing salmon hatchery. And then uh, as uh, Representative Boyce behind me knows, last year we came close to losing elk hatchery. And that's been the case every year since about 2017 that we've had some close calls. We expect that to continue. That's just one of the challenges of climate change. Um, we're seeing warmer rivers, decreased flows, and given that we're rearing cold water species, this places challenges on our hatchery staff to rear um, fish in those warm waters. 
Uh, additionally, we've got rising costs. So um, while the state has been uh, generous in giving us cost of living increases, which we appreciate, when you have that against flat funding, then eventually you get a point where um, you know, the income doesn't match the, out the outgoing. On top of that, uh, we've got these shortages, global shortages in fish food, fish oil. Um, that's caused by uh, challenges in supply of anchovies and herring. And that's the base constituent of the fish food that um, constitutes a lot of our supplies and services in this hatchery budget. And that's likely to continue as well. So rising costs um, and a flat funding, both in federal and state dollars. And then the third piece that's really challenging is deferred maintenance. So a lot of these facilities were built in the 1950s, 1960s and 70s. And as you know, concrete has a, uh, a lifespan and we're starting to see some degradation in that. In addition, all the piping um, and, and the bill is really coming due on a lot of that. The state has been investing over time in trying to uh, maintain these facilities. We had a $10 million investment for the legislature in about 2017, was it correct? Um, and that really helped um, shore up some of our coastal facilities as well as in the valley. But the bill is, is a lot larger than that. And we're starting to see some investments on the federal side and the Columbia River Basin. Um, we're starting to see some investments in coal rivers. And those are really uh, good to see, but they're still falling short again. So those three kind of buckets are really where the challenges lie. And given that, um, that's why we started a few years ago to take a look at what it would mean to be proactive about being uh, kind of putting a sustainable hatchery system in place. In uh, 2023, in the legislature, um, the legislature recognized the same challenge and um, put a budget note in place that really gave the department some funds to procure some contracting to ask some of the questions that are going to help inform those decisions. There's three big buckets that the legislature asked for information on. One of the buckets was around the economics. So what are the costs involved with operating these hatcheries and programs? Um, what are the benefits, the economic benefits that are occurring to communities in, in Oregon from these programs? What's the funding model that we have? And what's the sustainability of that funding model? The other uh, second bucket was around what are the, um, how are the, impacts and benefits of hatchery fish on, on wild fish incorporated into the planning and policies at the state and federal level. And then the third bucket was around the climate resilience, really. What are the, what are the risks that we're facing and uh, how are we going to mitigate for those risks? So the department's been working on uh, addressing or putting contracts out to bid to address these questions for the last few months. And we've made progress in the last month even. We've got six contracts out the door, uh, looking at a whole range of factors. Um, the statement of works stay really close to the budget note. And then we've got a, a seventh contract that we're working on currently with the contractor to finalize that statement of work. Um, we're looking at potentially one or two more contracts going out the door soon. So that's where the, we are in the process. And in terms of the timeline, uh, we're really in the information gathering phase. Uh, that's going to occur over the next few months. We've got some tight turnaround times for these contractors. Expect to have materials back from them uh, starting in May through June. We're going to be compiling all that material, and then we're going to um, be sharing a lot of that with the public. We're going to have a lot of discussions with the public and interested parties about what makes sense for the saturation system going forward, given these challenges, given what we're going to need to do to maintain it. And we expect that to occur in the summer period, somewhere between um, July and September, just depending on when we get materials back. And following that, we're going to be uh, putting together a report for the legislature in 25. It's really going to be a blueprint for how to move forward. I think this is going to be a challenging exercise, um, but one we need to go through uh, to make sure we can have a sustainable system moving forward. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Commissioner King. Thank you, Carol. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Sean, uh, for the report. Um, 
I'm not sure how in the world, how, how does anyone answer it? Maybe we need to do the study to, to even get there. Mm. But one of the things I talk about a lot is our own ODFW infrastructure. Okay. And one of the things I, I just don't have the mental construct to tolerate is, say, building in a floodplain or a tsunami zone or things like that. Like when we're talking about replacing infrastructure, don't make the same mistakes, basically. <laughs> like we have to come to modern standards, the modern realities, we have to green our operations, et cetera. Are we gonna be doing the same sort of things with the hatcheries? Because for example, what we learned about yesterday in the Umqua, that river is warming. It burned to a crisp, it might happen again. Like with all the things that we're talking about with the fire landscape, that, that so many hatcheries have been at risk. You know, our forests are a tinderbox for lots of different reasons. And so are we doing things like, you know, we can't just build back what was there. Like we, we can't just do the same thing. So is there somewhere in this that we're pivoting and getting to now in like, you know, whatever we build next, will be applicable to the future that we're facing. I realize it's a bit vague. <laughs> uh, Chair Wall, Commissioner King. Yeah, that's exactly the question we're gonna be asking and answering in this look. And I mentioned yesterday that we know that we can't build the same that we've done before. Uh, as these rivers are warming and flows are decreasing, we're gonna need technology like chilling and recirculation, for example, to address some of that. But also it makes sense to look at maybe not just investing in the same system we've had, but a different system. When you think about some of the impact of these fires, and we're three and a half years out from 2020, and we haven't made any progress at Klamath or Rock Creek, um, you can't have a system that is that vulnerable, that if you lose one or two hatcheries, and we could have lost a couple more in that intervening period, you can't sustain that. So we're gonna be looking at those questions about fire vulnerability, um, and all the other climate vulnerabilities and asking how can you put in place a system that is resilient to those. So, yeah. And will there be, again, the greening operations within that? I think I saw Solar Sea somewhere on there. Um, I, I, I think it's the trash catchery that generates too much power, meaning they, the, the local utility can't handle how much solar power they create, but can you talk about that? Yeah, yeah that's an interesting example where we put in place solar to offset some of the um, electrical demand at that, at that facility and uh, just because of the amount of power it's generating, the local utility can't take all of that. But that's a consideration. You know, we have a climate ocean change policy that commits the department to being carbon neutral by mid-century. And that's, you know, a filter that we're looking at the Saturday Resilience Initiative through. And so wherever we're talking about um, potentially investing in technologies like chilling and infrastructure, and we're looking at how we can offset those costs through solar power, essentially. And we have made strides in the program um, you know, under Scott's leadership, looking at investing in, in conduit hydro, for example, at Clackamas, um, and putting in place some of these mm -hmm. solutions to really offset the demand for the hatchery system on electricity. I think that's it for now. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, um, I just uh, am really thankful that the legislature uh, was wanting this to be looked at now. I think it's really important. When we, you know, I got to go to Rock Creek a couple years ago and see what was going on there. Um, it's pretty bleak being there again yesterday and seeing what's happening with the water temperatures and the costs that we're looking at. Um, so I'm glad that we're taking an, an, an infrastructure broad lens look um, at what the future looks like with hatcheries. But I think the most important thing coming up with this is to really stay tightly connected with communities who love their fish right, and making sure that um, we're not sending uh, any messages that make people feel like they're going to get disconnected from fishing in ways they've known or, you know, just I think it's an important conversation, especially I was thinking about that yesterday and talking to a few people in the van when we left. Rock Creek is a good example. I mean, if it, you know, I know my 
my own family that's in Douglas Van County. You know, they have that they have a, they have relationships with these places like Rock Creek Hatchery. You know, we have it in Klamath, Klamath Hatchery. So how do you not um, disconnect people from these places and the and the past and family stories and connections while also being really smart about where it's going to make sense to invest in the future. And I think that's a that's something we need people to really begin thinking about now. Um, and so I don't again sound like what I said to Brian about the meal there. Sean, Dr. Clements, I would like you to fix this. <laughs> no, no challenge there, right? I know challenge. <laughs> yeah. No ta everyone's gonna be happy, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> No, uh, sure. Well, uh, Vice Chair Heffield Hyde, I think that's why I said this was going to be really challenging. Um, yeah. And one of the things we're also looking at, for example, is the different runs that we produce: so summer steelhead, winter steelhead, fall chinook, spring chinook, coho. Those are all going to have different climate vulnerabilities, and we're seeing that play out now. And so that's why I say the system in the future may look different from it is what it is now. Um, both in terms of the infrastructure and the programs we're we're rearing. But the commitment's there that we we recognize that this demand is going to go on. There's likely to be more need for um, for example, for conservation programs. And we're looking at how we can put in place infrastructure that's going to meet all those needs, um, recognizing that they're going to be different in future. Mr. Spellbrook. <clears throat> Thank you, Joe. I, I don't have any question. I just am going to emphasize the economic importance that these fisheries are to you know local economies, uh, areas. And I know I'm not telling Sean anything; he knows that. And I'm just going to go about 3,000 miles to give you an example here. This from Lake Michigan. Uh, we sent uh, our fish. We sent our hatchery fish back there, and I think they, it was 1966 through 70 that uh, we sent millions of of coho and chinook from Northwest hatcheries. And they were planted a smoke back in the in the Great Lakes. And you pull up uh, some, this is the Great Lakes. Uh, this study was from the University of Wisconsin in 2018. And this is Great Lakes sport fishing generated by the hatchery fish we sent them. They said uh, it generates $7.7 .7 billion in economic activity and supports 49,000 jobs now at the Great Lakes salmon fishery. It was closer, I'd be there. <laughs> Did you have another question? Oh, I'm sorry. Sean, I have a couple questions. Um, thank you for the report. And uh, like others, I'm really glad that we are moving forward with this. It can't be easy um, and it's going to take us a while, but I am I appreciate that we're looking at this. Um, I have one question and then a comment and another question. So the first one is there are dam removals happening in different places across the state. Can you talk about how this might help us be better prepared, if you will, for things like reintroduction or recognizing that as those dams come out, if in wherever that happens, will this help us be better prepared to answer questions about what our management should look like in those areas? Uh, Chair Waldo, you always throw us curveballs. <laughs> <laughs> I can skip that one and go to the other one if you want. Well, it, it's a interesting question. So, you know, there's there's all these discussions about Snake River dams removal, um, and a lot of the programs in the Upper Snake uh, Upper Columbia are tied to mitigation. Um, I think it's unclear if that happens, what kind of um, the outcome will be there for some of those mitigation programs, but it really should be tied to the recovery of wild fish and those wild fish being healthy enough that they can sustain the fisheries that were lost previously. And that's certainly what we're looking at in the Willamette too. Like we get fish passage there and we can reintroduce uh, spring chinook and winter steel above those dams. We would like to see those po wild populations being in the state that they can support the fisheries before we um, before we get to the point of uh, scaling back on the mitigation obligation. So it's really about um, as those dams come out, are we seeing the response from wild fish that they can provide those fisheries? Um, and we're quite a ways from answering that question. Uh, I think in other places in the state where we're looking at the health of wild runs, again, that's 
part of the conversation about where it makes sense to have uh, to do with this infrastructure. Like, where are you going to have it that is going to be a good neighbor to wild fish, but also provide for the demand that we that we have out there for these products? So, I think it's a tough question. Um, it probably will be something that we consider in these public discussions. Thank you. The other question I have is about this. As I have heard you describe this a few times in look through the budget note and heard a lot of people talking about it, I'm not looking at this as I haven't heard you describe it as a hatchery. We are a hatchery state, and are we going to be a hatchery state? It's more about, as I've heard it described, are we going to be a smart hatchery state? And there are so many questions in that, and you've listed out three challenges. Any one by itself would be enough for an analysis like this. Um, but are we also in this looking at which of the hatcheries are most effective, for instance, at being conservation hatcheries? Because as we move from plenty with some of these runs to more scarcity with these runs, are we looking at the, the hatcheries that will be more effective going forward with those kind of issues? Uh Chair Wall, I think part of what we're trying to do here is put in place a hatchery infrastructure that um, can is flexible enough to deal with whatever we need to do at the time. Um, and, and we've seen recently, for example, down on the south coast, where we had um, harvest augmentation programs for uh, Fall Chinook, but we're needing to provide space now for conservation programs for Fall Chinook. And that 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 is one of the things we'll be talking about in this public discussion is that these needs are likely to change through time, depending on health of wild runs, depending on the demand that's out there. And we need a system that's flexible enough to deal with whatever the challenge of the day is. Okay. Thank you. That helped. My last one is just always the wild fish issues and impacts come up. Is that part of the discussion is look at which hatcheries have impacts on wild fish or is that of a separate piece. Uh, Chair, well, yeah, the, the part of the budget note does ask us to look at how the um, impacts and benefits of hatchery fish on wild fish are incorporated into policies and planning. And as you're well aware, this commission sets policy for the department on how those hatcheries are operated to avoid having those impacts on, on wild fish. Um, so that's really not part of this look specifically in terms of the infrastructure. Again, the infrastructure is meant to put it to be put in place to provide um, the programs that are approved by this commission, which have the sideboards to protect wild fish. Thank you. Look forward to this report. So do we. Yeah, thanks, Sean, and thank thanks for all your leadership on this uh, topic as well. And I did also, commissioners, just want to note that. Uh, with regard to our enga public engagement, of course, consistent with state law and the governor's policy, we will we will be consulting with each of nine of Oregon's nine <clears throat> nine federally recognized tribes. And in fact, I think a letter uh, asking them to consult just went out last week, or maybe it was this week. This week, yeah, yeah. Thanks. That's a good reminder. Thank you. Thank okay. You. Cheers. Uh, next up, and the last presentation under the director's report, we're going to get an update from the Alaka Alliance and Jane Bakary. It's sea otters that'll make uh, Commissioner Khalil smile. I think I saw her smile. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, I'll have some photos to make you smile. Uh, let me just. Other in English. Okay. Um, which button? Just the forward arrow? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, well, thank you, uh, Director Melcher and Commissioner Wall and members of the Commission. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you today about reestablishing a population of sea otters to the Oregon coast. For the record, my name is Jane Bakary. I'm the Executive Director of the Alaco Alliance. And I realized that I titled my presentation today, Alaco Alliance Update. Um, I'm going to talk about um, an update on efforts to reestablish sea otters in Oregon, not just about the Alaka Alliance. Um, we're alliance, which means we work with many, many partners. We can't do this work alone. So, um, so just a little bit about the Alaka Alliance, since I am going to talk a little bit about us. <laughs> 
Um, we are a uh, 501c3 nonprofit in Oregon, and we are a diverse um, uh, group of partners with a shared vision of reestablishing a population of sea otters so that 50 years from now, our children and grandchildren um, can realize sea otters in the wild and also have a robust and resilient uh, coast off the coast of Oregon. Mm -hmm. um, we uh, were informally established by Dave Hatch, who was a member of the Siletz tribe about 20 years ago. And um, the idea came about because he was building a wooden dinghy with his son, Peter, and they were looking for a name for the dinghy. And he came across the Chinook word alaka, which means sea otter. And so great name for a boat, but it also got him thinking, well, you know, if there's words that mean sea otter in not just the Chinook language, but in other tribal languages in Oregon, and there's place names in Oregon, Otter Point, Otter Rock, we have sea otters here, why don't we have them now? And so sea otters disappeared from the coast of Oregon as a result of the maritime fur trade over a hundred years ago. So no one has a living experience with sea otters in Oregon. Um, so Dave brought together a group of people that kind of helped him think through, well, you know, is it important that we think about bringing them back? What does that mean? And also he recognized as a tribal member that they are part of their stories. Historically, they have been part of their cultural traditions. And so that was also quite important to him. Fast forward, sadly, Dave died unexpectedly in 2016. And uh, a group of folks that had worked with him on this idea of the Alaka Alliance decided to think about formalizing it. And we became a 501c3 in 2020 um, and for, formally um, incorporated in 2018. So here we are today. So our goal is quite simple, is to restore a healthy population I remember both things, <laughs> a healthy population of sea otters um, on the Oregon coast and in the process to make Oregon's near shore marine ecosystem more robust and more resilient. Um, this mission statement was purposely um, uh, crafted to include broader ecosystem restoration as a theme. Um, this isn't just about sea otters. I mean, some people find them the most compelling part of what we do, but it really is about broader marine ecosystem conservation and restoration. Um, I mentioned the cultural connections, and in addition to restoring the ecosystem functions and resiliency, restoring cultural connections with organ tribes is also incredibly important to our mission. Um, historic and archaeological evidence shows that sea otters were part of the traditions, um, the ceremonies, the stories, and really the cultural history of our tribal people. And so um, from the very beginning, um, beyond just the Sluts mm -hmm. tribe, we've worked to engage other Oregon coastal tribes, uh, in particular uh, the Confederate tribes of the Coos, Umpqua and Lois Lysla, and uh, the Coquel tribe, but we're not exclusive, but they were the ones that had the greatest connection. Um, we have a board of uh, 12 members, three of which are currently tribal members, and we're also working um, with uh, tribes in uh, Northern California. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the tribes don't see the, the state boundary the way we do, and so um, recognizing that uh, they also have interest in sea otters and potential restoration. So, fast forward a little bit there. Sorry. Um, so bringing sea otters back to Oregon is not a new idea. Um, and if over 50 years ago, uh, there was an effort to reestablish sea otters in Oregon, along with Washington and Alaska. And this was part of the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission's effort to remove sea otters from areas in the Aleutian chain where they were doing um, uh, a bomb testing and recognizing that there had been some recovery in southeast Alaska and they didn't want to lose those animals. So um, they had successful translocations in Southeast Alaska, in Washington, and in Oregon, there were two attempts made um, for a total of 93 animals in 1970 and 71. Um, you know, this was a little bit of a rush job. It was well-planned, but the conditions in Oregon, as you know, can be quite difficult. 
and it didn't go quite as planned. And so the holding pens that they'd planned to keep the animals in didn't work out because the weather came up, so they just let the animals go. There was no established monitoring for those populations. Um, and so the monitoring was done a little bit on an ad hoc basis by folks that were quite interested in what might happen with these animals. And unfortunately, after about 10 years, there was no sign of the animals anywhere off the coast of Oregon. So, you know, the question is, why sea otters? Why now if it didn't work here 50 years ago? Sorry, I'm not very good with this. Um, and I think there's a lot of reasons why we should rethink it. Um, first of all, there's been successful translocations done for sea otters in Alaska, in Washington, and in California. Um, the science of conservation biology, translocations, has advanced immensely over the past 50 years. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why there's a little bit of an urgency to it right now. Um, sea otters are really critical as a keystone uh, species to the overall health and balance of our near shore ecosystems. Um, research that goes back to Jim Estes in Alaska around Amtrika Island showed that where there were sea otters in the Aleutian Islands, there was a thriving kelp and very diverse ecosystem. And when he dove in areas where sea otters did not exist, it was a much simpler ecosystem without the diversity or health that he saw otherwise. So that was sort of some of the, the uh, really early research around what it means to have a keystone species within a habitat. And so, um, as you probably know, we are experiencing a decline in our kelp ecosystems along the West Coast. It's particularly bad in Northern California, but we have areas in Oregon that have been hit very uh, significantly, in particular around Port Orford. And so not that sea otters are the magic bullet that's going to solve that, but when you were missing top predators like sea stars, uh, sunflower sea stars and sea otters, you have things like overpopulations of uh, sea urchins happening. And so that's something that's happened in a number of areas along our coast. And so finding ways and looking at the tools in the toolbox and reestablishing that balance is something that we feel is incredibly important. Um, beyond that, um, the southern sea otter um, subspecies down in California is listed under the ESA as a threatened species. Because of that listing, it does have a recovery plan, which means that they're looking for opportunities for rebuilding and establishing recovery of that population. Expanding the range of sea, some of sea otters is one of the things that they want to consider. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more into regulatory considerations about the challenges related to that. Um, so there's multiple reasons like why now and why Oregon. Um, I also wanted to mention that there is between central Washington and central California, there's about eight to 900 miles without sea otters. So we did have a historic population in Oregon. Researchers estimate it was probably around 4,000 animals um, as a result of the maritime fur trade they think that there was about 1% of the historic population of sea otters left by 1900. And so um, that, that was from probably an original population around 300,000. And so they're coming back in certain areas, but we do have a big gap in our historic range. So. Um, we hear a lot about sea otters and kelp. We don't always hear much about sea otters and estuaries. Um, and there's been research done though down in California in Elkhorn Slough. Elkhorn Slough has a recovered population of sea otters over the past 20 years. A lot of that is a result of translocations from the surrogacy program at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And they're doing quite well. They actually think that they're probably at carrying capacity in Elkhorn Slough. It's also provided a great opportunity for doing research about the impacts of um, sea otters in estuaries. Um, estuaries could be a potential site for reintroduction, not necessary, but also because they are sort of a, a sheltered area along our otherwise rocky coast, they could be an area that sea otters might just decide to hang out in if there was a reestablished population. So it's important to understand how they how they interact with sea otters in them. Down in California, they found that eelgrass um, benefited from sea otters because eelgrass depend on small invertebrates to eat algae off them 
without sea otters, you had over overpopulation of the small crabs that generally eat um, uh, that eat those invertebrates. And then with sea otters, the invertebrates were allowed to thrive because the sea otters were eating some of the crab, and then hence you had a, a healthier eelgrass uh, ecosystem down there. Um, also, there was a paper that was just published in Nature last month looking at the impact of sea otters and alkaline slough on erosion in, in, in the estuary. And it found that sea otters have benefited um, the estuary incredibly because there's less erosion happening as a result of the sea otters eating some of the crabs that otherwise would be eating into uh, the, the mudflats. So that's pretty interesting and very timely right now. Um, so with species conservation, species reintroductions, um, I think of it as a three-legged stool. You know, you've you've got your you've got your science and your data, you've got your people, the stakeholders and the communities, and then you've got your institutions, the agencies that make decisions, make things happen. So um, since 2019, the Yalaka Alliance has had a strategic plan, and we've um, formed it around those three legs of the stool. Um, the first part of it is we are working um, and working with partners to complete the scientific assessment, fill information gaps that are necessary to inform decision making around sea otter reintroduction. The second part is building awareness, building understanding and listening to people, understanding what the values are, what the concerns are, what the interest is, what the enthusiasm is for people, not just along the coast, but you know, the coast belongs to everybody. So the stakeholders throughout the state really. And then finally, the red box is only after this work is done, can there be decision-making that happens around sea otter reintroduction. And the full disclosure is the Alaka Alliance is not going to do that. We are not the decision maker. We're not the organization that's gonna take the sea otters and put them in the water in Oregon. But the reason that we matter is, we are facilitating that conversation in Oregon where it otherwise isn't happening. We haven't had sea otters for over a hundred years. People don't know what it's like to have sea otters. And they, they, in fact, most of the people that we speak with don't realize that we do not have wild sea otters in Oregon. They see them at the Oregon Zoo or they see them at the Oregon Coast Aquarium, which is great, but they automatically assume that they can see them off the coast of Oregon, or maybe they've seen them in California, and they act, they're pretty surprised. So we're helping to have folks understand why it's important that we think about bringing them back. So I want to talk a little bit um, about that one leg of the stool, about the, the information and the science that uh, we're facilitating, in some cases, getting money and subcontracting for folks to do. Um, we're a small organization. Um, I only came on as executive director a couple of years ago. Our, our board chair, Bob Bale, who was kind of running the show. Um, we now, I doubled my staff last year. We've got four staff, uh, myself. We've got an outreach uh, director. We have a coastal coordinator who's based down in North Bend, and he's the one that's sort of our eyes and ears on the coast and really having the conversation with communities. And I just hired a science and policy director uh, based in Gold Beach, and she's going to be working uh, with partners and agencies on a lot of this work moving forward. Um, one of the most important things that we did early on was to complete a feasibility study. And this was done in 2020, to be complete in 2022, we received money from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to do that study. Um, you can see it on our, on our website. We also have some hard copies if you're interested. Very robust report, um, over 200 pages, completed by six uh, world-renowned scientists that looked at all the different elements from you know, the history of translocations to the prey and habitat availability along the entire Oregon coast. They actually developed, uh, Dr. Tim Tinker developed a model for Oregon uh, to look at uh, different predictions of what might happen if we had sea otters here. Um, that was followed up by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service actually completing their own feasibility assessment six months later. Uh, there was a uh, budget directive, but not funded, um, that was included in U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's budget in 2021 that directed them to do a feasibility assessment. They had one year to do it. Um, and they did a fabulous job. It's available online. But what they did was they knew we were doing this because they funded it. And so they said, hey, we're going to do something that's complementary to this. And so they referenced the localized feasibility study extensively. So it's not redundant. It's actually um, a, a great complementary um, document. 
Um, so uh, a few other things that we've worked on, we've done a high level economic assessment that helped us highlight other areas that we want to get more information on regarding economic impacts. Um, we've done some GIS work. Um, we worked and got some funding and worked with a contractor to develop some recommended amendments to the Oregon Nearshore Conservation Strategy that address uh, both sea otters and kelp habitats. Um, and we have a grant from the Oregon, uh, um, Oregon Recreation and Conservation Fund, <laughs> trying not to use that, my acronyms, um, to do a study looking at the presence um, of uh, sharks off the Oregon coast. There has been some um, impact on uh, sea otter mortality down in California from young great white sharks. Um, a lot of that is, I think is because of warming ocean conditions, the young sharks are coming in closer and they don't eat sea otters, but they will take an exploratory bite, which of course ends up being a mortality for a sea otter. So before we put a lot of effort and money into any reintroduction organ, we want to better understand what that risk might be here. Um, we have also, uh, the Marine Mammal Commission uh, funded some study to look at what what the projected impacts of climate change might be on a translocated population and seeing sure solutions just uh, completed that report. Um, so we've got a little more information there. Um, some of the information gaps that we still have are really better understanding what the potential impacts might be on our fisheries in Oregon. Um, we have funded right now um, a study that we're just waiting to sign the contract uh, that will look at um, potential impacts on commercial uh, crab and urchin fisheries in Oregon. I think that's going to be a really important piece of information. Um, it's not necessarily new research. There's what, and I'll talk a little bit more about it. I've got another slide, but um, I, I think it's going to be a good um, outreach piece for our fishery stakeholders to help them better understand what may or may not happen. Um, uh, we're also working with partners on a reintroduction plan, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. And finally, there's been some questions. We hear a lot about uh, the role of kelp and seagrasses in uh, sequestering carbon. And we've been thinking about, you know, would it be helpful to better understand what the uh, blue carbon or ecosystem services impacts might be from CR reintroduction? Um, we don't have that funded right now. So. So the bottom line, um, you know, what did we, what were some of the takeaways from these feasibility studies? Um, first, th they both indicated that reintroductions are a successful conservation tool. We've seen them used with other species to great success, not necessarily without conflict, but I think overall we've had some very successful um, opportunities with using reintroductions. Um, reintroducing sea otters to Oregon is, has been concluded as something that could be biologically successful, but we need to think about some of the other considerations, the socioeconomic ones in particular. Um, and then um, we need, there's, there's a lot of things that need to be thought about. You know, it's not just the science, it's the social science, it's the economics that we need to consider. There's also regulatory considerations. Um, the, the, how sea otters are regulated um, varies by subspecies, it varies by state, and it varies by federal legislation. And so it can be a complex regulatory environment, um, and I can mention a little bit more about that um, in a future slide. And then, um, you know, there's direct and indirect effects related to sea otter conservation and reintroduction. Um, some of the, the direct effects might be, you know, the, the joy or the opportunities that come with tourism related to sea otters. Um, there also could be a effect on recreational fisheries, maybe not a good one. So we want to better understand what some of those are. And finally, um, it concluded that um, estuaries may be an important reintroduction environment, but certainly not conclusive. So a few of the reintroduction considerations that uh, we're thinking about, and we're thinking about these with partners. So this effort um, is now much more of a regional effort. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's feasibility assessment um, looked at the region from Northern California and all of Oregon. It did not include Southern Washington because they concluded that the conservation benefits of reintroduction in Southern Washington we're probably not great enough to consider it within the realm of that assessment. So we're looking at the region as Northern California from basically Santa Cruz to the border and then all of Oregon. Um, there, as I mentioned, there's an, um, 
is a, a, a myriad of uh, regulatory protections. Southern sea otters only found in California are listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. Northern sea otters found in Washington, Alaska, do not have any ESA protections, except for a specific unit in Southwest Alaska, which mm -hmm. had been listed as threatened since 2005 because of their declining populations. Each state has its own protections in Oregon, sea otters, the species not separated by subspecies is listed as threatened under our Endangered Species Act. So, you know, it, it varies and it's something that um, the Marine Mammal Protection Act also has protections for all marine mammals. They have a, um, uh, up in Alaska, Alaskan natives can take, have a subsistence and traditional take allowance uh, tribes in the lower 48 do not have that. Also, southern sea otters is no incidental take under the Marine Mammal Protection Act allowed for them. It's it's specified. So it gets pretty complicated and people can get a little bit nervous about what that might mean, what that regulatory environment might be, not just for fishing, fishing but other operations in the near shore area. Um, so um, these are some of the things that need to be incorporated and thought about as we think about reintroduction. Additionally, animal health, behavior, uh, the logistics of translocation. You know, do you have the facilities nearby? Um, down in uh, California, you've got the Monterey Bay Aquarium. The translocations of certain animals have been very close to that facility for that reason. You know, they're, they're concerned about animal welfare. And just understanding stakeholders' concerns and perspectives. Um, there's, I, I don't believe there's going to be 100% uh, agreement on this, but I think that there's room for people to better understand and uh, understand why this is important and perhaps accept it. I only have a couple more slides, so thank you for your time. Um, I mentioned the Fisher study, and um, we have we should be getting this done this year. Um, it, it's looking at a narrow scope right now: commercial Dungeness crab and sea urchin fisheries in Oregon. Um, we had a model developed as part of this feasibility assessment, but um, right now the Monterey Bay Aquarium and the Alaco Alliance are funding a further refinement of the California population model, the Oregon model, into a, an integrated model for the region, much more robust. Uh, many thanks to ODF and W um, uh, Marine Resource folks because they're helping to provide some data that will be incorporated into that model. The idea behind this fishery study is to use the model to simulate various scenarios along the Oregon coast in Northern California for reintroduction, but primarily focused on Oregon for this study, and then look at uh, fishing fisheries landing data for Dungeness crab and sea urchin to understand where they may be overlap and what some of the concerns might be for fishermen. And then really it's an engagement. We're working with five ports and we're going to be having our contractor um, convene meetings with fishing stakeholders in those ports to have a conversation about what the findings are from this study. Um, one thing that, um, we have heard from uh, crabbers in particular, I, I did a presentation at the Oregon Dutchers Crab Commission, is they're concerned about what is going to happen to the population of Dutchers Crab if there's a sea otter population in Oregon. And um, what they, uh, the, the experience that they have is either fishing themselves or having colleagues that participate in the Dutchers Crab fishery in Southeast Alaska, and they'll say, look what happened in Alaska. And so, um, you know, there's a there's a number of things that need to be considered here. First of all, um, Oregon is not Alaska, and the habitat in Alaska, and particularly Southeast Alaska, has a lot of bays and coves, and it's very shallow. And the translocation of sea otters there, the habitat was ideal, and it has allowed them to grow. And there's you know there's, there's a lot of capacity up there, and about thirty thousand sea otters in Southeast Alaska. So I mentioned earlier, Oregon probably had 4,000 tops historically. We have a very linear coastline. We do not have nooks and uh, crannies like Southeast Alaska does. And um, we the shallow habitat drops off pretty quickly. So there's a little bit of a depth refuge for crabbers in the sense that there may not be that much overlap between a lot where a lot of the landings are and where sea otters might exist. Um, this is an example also of sea otter population growth. This looks at translocated, translocated populations 
and the green line at the top is Southeast Alaska. The other lines are Washington, British Columbia, um, and um, and I can't I can't see it. anyway. I, I think um, Washington, British Columbia, and California. And so um, the the bottom line actually is I can't remind the little slide. The bottom line though, I, I think that was the California one. They don't grow very quickly, the populations. These these animals have one pup a year at best. And whether that pup survives or not is iffy also. And so this is a this is an animal that reproduces extremely slowly. Um, also, the books that monitor translocated populations show that let's say you have a population of 20, within 10 years, that population could drop by three quarters. And so it has a curve where you've got your, your translocated population, it dips, and you know what they're hoping for is then it kind of reaches a point where it's the, the, the uh, re reproduction is has it coming back up again. They estimate that it could take 20, 25 years to actually stabilize back to the original translocated population. So we're, it's going to happen slowly. We're not going to go from zero to 2,000 animals in two years. It's, it's not going to happen. <laughs> and um, the, this one also just shows the um, the San Nicolas Island, um, which was uh, the California mainland population, which is the gray line. Um, oops. So um, why is ALACA important? I mentioned that we're getting the word out. We're kind of the primary voice in Oregon right now, but we work with a number of partners, um, but we are doing a lot of outreach we have since the beginning. Um, we connect in multiple ways with the public. Um, I encourage you to look at our website. We've got um, some great webinars and some excellent videos um, that kind of uh, talk about different aspects of uh, sea otters and the marine environment in which they're found. Um, so uh, I think that this has been something that's been really critical to um, the work that we do that other agencies aren't able to do in the same way. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service last summer did a series of open houses, um, but you know they're, they're, they're the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They're very careful, um, and it was an opportunity for them, for them to share information, but also to be very clear that no decisions have been made yet, and they're not in a position where they're quite ready to make one. So um, I think that in order to be out there constantly, um, they don't have the resources. At this point, we put a lot of resources into that because we think it's really critical uh, to have that foundation before decisions are made. So finally, next steps. Um, collaborating in the regional scale is something that we are very involved in right now. So um, there is there are CRs in California, but they are also looking at recovery plan to enhance that population, and they will be updating that recovery plan. Right now, the current recovery plan for Southern Sea Otters in California does not recommend translocation as a tool for expanding that population towards recovery. Um, scientists and agency folks down there would like to see that change, and the plan is updated. So that's something that needs to happen first, in particular before agencies, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is going to be ready to make any big decisions. We will continue to fill, fill some of the science and socioeconomic economic and policy gaps, and particularly we'd like to get some funding to do a study of potential impacts on recreational fisheries in Oregon, and also looking at what the impacts, both positive and negative, might be in estuaries and also in our oyster aqu aquaculture. So I think those are uh, two big information gaps that we have in Oregon that we need to get more information on. Um, right, the the opportunity work to work regionally has really enhanced our ability to in, uh, engage tribes and tribal leadership. Um, I tell people at the end of the day, if I don't have a job anymore, it means I've been successful because, you know, I, if we have the opportunity to do something like they've done with California condors, for a tribe to take leadership over this and want to manage it and have the capacity to do that, that's a win. And so um, Alaka doesn't feel like they need to own this, 
but we do want to facilitate it and be the value added wherever it, it, we can be. Um, so that's a goal. And then um, at the, we will be working with California partners, regional partners on developing um, a reintroduction plan, whatever that might look like, recommendations for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service so that they can get to a point where they can make a decision about an EVA analysis and move forward with um, an analysis of alternatives for the region. Uh, um, like I said, we're an alliance. We work with multiple partners. Um, I, I'm so thankful for the nonprofit agency and uh, conservation partners we work with, and also for the foundations and individual donors that really make this work possible. So it's it, it takes a village and then some. And finally, I just want to thank you and see if you have any questions. Thank you, Jane. Uh, we do have one from Commissioner Spellbrink and then Commissioner Labhart, and we will also check with Commissioner Khalil, who may have one. So. Oh, yeah, Thank you, Chair Wall. Uh, yeah, appreciate the attitude to working with the industry and stuff because, you know, I was a commercial crab fisherman for yep. over 40 years. So, you know, I know there's some concerns with the Dungeon and Crab Fleet. Uh, you know, one of the things that's been why the crab fishery is such a good fishery, self sustaining fishery, yep. is, you know, we only take the crabs at the end of their life cycle. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we have what they call size, sex, and season. Don't take mm -hmm. females, don't take sublegal crabs which are reproductively mature and uh, of course you know uh that wouldn't <laughs> be uh there's no such regulation for sea otters but uh there, i do agree with you that you know we have more uh, i fish southeast alaska too and i saw some of those what happened up there with some of those fisheries there that were kind of wiped out but there's a huge population up there mm -hmm. and i think things are more condensed there also like you described uh the uh, now one thing I was going to mention is have you uh, now Washington? I spent a fair amount of time fishing on you know, around the Olympic Peninsula there around Destruction Island, and I've heard that there's a fairly robust population now on Destruction Island, uh, thousand plus animals, fifteen hundred something like that, and and so I'm and that's pretty good productive crab grounds right mm -hmm. through there too because I've spent a lot of time there, and uh, I just wonder I I have not talked to Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife they must they must have some data on that now if it's affecting that fishery or what's going on there. Yeah, you know, we, we've had questions about that, too, because the population in Washington is still increasing. They don't think it's reached a carrying capacity, um, but we have not heard any um, information about um, significant impacts to the crab fishery up there. Some of the tribes up there have been concerned about the impact on uh, uh, shellfish um, uh, um, clams and, and, and razor clams, exactly. And so, um, and they, they have stated some concerns about that there, but um, the crab fishery, we have not heard any any negative impacts, significant ones. It's not to say that if the population doesn't continue to grow, that there may be some areas, but also be where the fishing's happening um, compared to where the sea otters are actually uh, feeding. Um, yeah, they and... they will they will prefer shallower habitats. They're they're pretty lazy in that way. You know, like they don't want to expend any more energy than they have to, and so they will they'll they'll go where areas where there's shellfish uh, prey resources available that aren't too deep. That that area around Destruction Island should be good habitat for them, and yeah. I think that population has increased substantially. Yeah. I mean, I think I heard 1,500 animals uh -huh. living on Destruction Island, which is you know fairly good sized island. But anyway, I I actually reached out to Fish and Wildlife up there a couple of different times, but. Mm -hmm. I never got the call back. Yeah. You know, everybody's busy, I guess. Yeah. Uh, that'd be interesting. I think there's probably some uh, information that can be obtained from up in that area. Sure. Thank you. Yep. Thank, thanks, Jane. <clears throat> uh, just so the commissioners know, uh, I have been a member of the Alaska Alliance Public Advisory Committee since it became a 501c3. And so I attend all the meetings, uh, participate in all the discussions. And so if, if anybody, any of the commissioners or any members of the public need information, um, I get all the information. I get the scientific reports. I get the minutes from all the meetings. And so I'd be more than happy to uh, to forward those two commissioners. I've been intimately involved in this process since the beginning. Thank you, Commissioner Lapphart. I meant to recognize you. Thank you. <laughs> one fun. Oh, go ahead. No, there is one. Go ahead, Commissioner Khalil. Oh. Yes. Hi, Jane. Uh, just wanted to say it's really exciting. It's been a minute since I was involved in LACA pre-pandemic. Um, I was attending some of your meetings, but um, it's really exciting to see how things are coming along. And I really just love your stance of not needing to be the people who own this. 
Um, and the idea that, I mean, that's a, the mark of a true convener, right? Is that it's collaboration without ego. And I really appreciate that approach. Um, and it's like, this is a, sort of a question, but maybe just a bookmark for later is how we are communicating some of this at places like the Oregon Coast Aquarium that are directly related, you know, like right in the ecosystems that people are are considering and have access to a large swath of the population who may not know all the work that's going on behind the scenes to make this happen. Um, thank you. Um, so the Oregon Coast Aquarium, along with the Oregon Zoo, have been amazing partners for us, both outreach for support. They provided us with opportunities to present or to attend their events or to co um, co-lead uh, uh, educational activities with them. So, um, and I actually met with, um, I actually haven't met with the Oregon Coast Aquarium yet, but I met with Oregon Zoo a few months ago and we talked about, you know, what are some, you know, five talking points that we can all use together? They were kind of looking like, how can they promote that message and be consistent with the information that we have and the information we're sharing? So um, we will work with them certainly more closely moving forward, but they have been a great partner. Along those lines, just one last quick question. Mm -hmm. the you talked about the tribes and that they have been involved in that you have member board members who are tribal members mm -hmm. or officers um have they did you say that they have expressed an interest in maybe being the voice of this going forward or not potentially well, so okay. right now la no last year the alaka alliance and defenders of wildlife in california um assisted the sluts tribe with an application for america the beautiful grant which would help build some capacity within the Sluts tribe, but also it looked to bring in other tribal members. Um, very good feedback on the proposal. They did not receive it, um, but based on the feedback, um, everyone that was involved felt like it's it's probably worth another try this year. And because everyone has experience with doing it the first time, it, it was a process. Um, I think it will be a little bit easier this time because we'll know what we're doing. Um, but this is also, it was a great opportunity last year to start reaching out to just other tribes. The Yurok, the Talawa in particular, uh, were quite interested. They're doing work um, in marine areas and they're building up some capacity in marine areas. Um, but I think just having conversation with other tribes to say, what are your interests in the marine near shore area? for the resources, for the management, um, and just kind of see where they want to lead rather than making assumptions or, you know, kind of trying to pull folks along. I mean, one thing that we have heard from a couple of tribes is like, it, even if they get the money, hiring people now is so difficult that, you know, money doesn't solve the capacity issue all the time. And so just being sensitive to um, how they want to be involved and in, to what capacity they can, they have to do that, so. Thank you. Thank you for the work. Well, I, I, I'd i like to wish Director Melcher a very happy retirement and thank you so much for your leadership. I, I worked with Kurt when I was in the governor's office 18 years ago and it was great having that opportunity and to see where ODFNW is right now and just kind of it's, it, I, I, I was very distracted from a few things I was trying to get to for my board meeting next week with the presentations and some good things happening here. So thank you. Yeah. Thank Thanks, you. Jane. Another Kulungoski staffer, <laughs> <laughs> former Kulungoski staffer. All right. Yes, next up, uh, commissioners is adoption of temporary rules. We have five temporary rules on the TAN agenda that require your ratification. I'm happy to answer any questions on them that you might have. See questions, but I bet we have a motion. Vice Chair. Yes, um, I would make the motion. I move to ratify the five temporary rules set forth on the March 15th agenda. Second that. Been moved and seconded to adopt the temporary rules as read into the record. Um, let's do a thumb vote on this one. Those in favor, Michelle, it's everybody, including um, Commissioner Khalil on screen. So thank you. Thank you on that one. Um, commissioners were to the um, commission updates on the <laughs> agenda, and we're going to add a little bit of a 
recognition here, you knew you weren't going to get away without being embarrassed a little bit, right? We would like to take just a minute to recognize that this is Kurt Melcher's last meeting as director. Um, and each of us will maybe steal a minute to talk about that. I've had a couple chances in the past um, few days to say something. I would like to say something that will be repetitive for those who, have, who were around yesterday. But um, one of the things about Kurt is that it's incredibly easy to respect his role, his approach, what he has accomplished in this director role and as a public servant. It's, it's, it's impressive and it's great to have had it for all of these years. One of the things that I do wanna mention also that, that a few of you have heard before is that the legacy, you've heard about the, the financial status of this agency and that it's in great shape. This is an agency ready to move to its next chapter for the financial and for several other reasons. Um, and those are um, a clear indicator of Kurt's leadership skills. One of those that I, I think you've seen this morning displayed is that we have a skilled, well-trained, committed staff in every corner of this state ready to take on these problems that are complex and intriguing, but that is also, and maybe that's the very best part of, of Kurt's legacy. So those are the things that I wanted to mention, and I'll give the other commissioners a chance to say something if they would like to. Okay. Uh, first of all, I was uh, joking with uh, Director Melcher at the break. We have a lot of reports and things going on this morning, but not a lot of business. And we have people here wanting to give public testimony to us. And yet we're up here like commenting and over commenting on all these things. Uh, and uh, it's just funny. Uh, there has to be some durability to a uh, director for just being able to, to deal with his commission for all these years as well. So I want to give that to Kurt. Um, I have to say, I'll keep it brief. Again, thank you for your decades of service to fish and wildlife and communities. Um, thank you for your integrity. It is apparent everywhere you go. Um, thank you for leading this agency, leaving this agency in such a strong position for all of us uh, and a real springboard for, uh, for whoever comes next. And then finally, uh, I consider you a friend. And if you ever find yourself out bumping around the backside of the Oregon desert, you're sure welcome. Okay, next in line, I'm gonna be uh, fairly short, but um, I hope that people listen to my comments because they are fairly short. But, um, you know, fish and wildlife don't have a voice. They can't speak. And so we speak for them. And the director is the head of the agency that's, that leads that effort to speak for fish and wildlife. And here's what Director Melcher has accomplished. And that is our mission state, to protect and enhance fish and wildlife and their habitats for use and enjoyment by present and future generations. In the five years I've been on this commission, I have not observed one time, not one time when Director Melcher doesn't have that mission in his mantra and make sure that staff understands that mission to protect and enhance Oregon's fish and wildlife and their habitats for use and enjoyment by present and future generations. Sir, you should be very pleased. Um, you have left this state better then you found it when you came to this agency many years ago and leading this agency. So i um, very proud to have uh, worked underneath your tutelage and that you've always kept that mission statement and, and focus. And so we're going to miss you. Uh, wish you the best in retirement. Thanks. Mr. Stelton. Thank you, Chair Wall. Uh, yeah, you know, 
in my <laughs> lifetime, my work career, whatever, I've, I've seen a few individuals. It doesn't really matter where they start in an organization. It's where they end up, you know, and I think Kurt's a prime example of that started, you know, uh, entry level uh, position in the department and, you know, now he's retired as director and, and uh, you know, the, I, I remember one of my friends that I would put in that box. He, he moved here back here from this, uh, from Montana and he went to work at GP and he said it was the only place that he never really, that didn't happen. You know, he said it's like he got put in a box and he stayed there. He said, That's the only place where I haven't started at, where I didn't work my way up somewhere near the top. You know, he'd been manager of a mill. We started at an entry level position, you know, but anyway, Gert, just wanted to say that uh, I think you're a great, great example for all of us. Bob. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, for the sake of uh, brevity is the soul of wit, which is something I know that Kurt likes and I appreciate. I'm not going to say the same thing over and over and over that has been said for weeks now. Um, I will simply give a toast. And I know that your name is probably anglicized German. Um, I don't know your heritage particularly. <laughs> but um, so I looked up some some ideas of toasts and just kind of how you say, you know, Godspeed or, you know, Bon Voyage and all of those sorts of things. So um, an amazing example I found in German was Uber den Wolken, which means above the clouds, which seems so appropriate to like where we are today. But I thought, you know, this is America. You can make stuff up. You, we're all, a, you know, a melting pot of everything. And so I sighed. I will send you off with one of my favorite blessings, which happens to be Irish. And it starts, and many of you may know it. Um, it starts with, may the road rise, excuse me, may the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. May the rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, May God hold you in the palm of his or her hand. God speak, Kurt. Thank you. And Commissioner Khalil, would you have your hand? How am I supposed to follow that, Leslie? Jeez Louise. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say that I think, um, first of all, thank you. You have been so welcoming and kind. And it is, you know, in this increasingly polarized and, and competitive world, it's just well, lovely to meet a kind human being. And so thank you so much for being that. Uh, and also say that, you know, I think all any of us can ask from our careers is that we move the needle just a little bit uh, on the this massive, complex problem of wildlife conservation. And I hope you go into your retirement knowing that you have done exactly that uh, and that your career has mattered and that you have done something um, to move that very, very challenging and complex needle. So congratulations. Thank you. Yes, this is my final commission meeting. <laughs> I think I started tallying them up last night. And I, I think it's 179 of these I've been to, both as the deputy and then as the director. So, been uh, yeah, I've been a long. That's a long tenure sitting in these meetings. Um, and I and I know I you know I don't have any pre prepared remarks. Uh, I I think um, uh, I truly have enjoyed my career. Uh, you know, Bob always taking these pictures of me, and then those pictures make it in various magazines, some of which are less than flattering. But <laughs> he's doing that again now. So uh, I guess I, I would I would say that you know it's been a great ride. Uh, I didn't I never set out to be the director 39 years ago. Um, been the director for not quite 10, uh, which is a pretty good stint. Done some amazing things. Uh, you all were asking me questions at dinner, and of course afterwards I had the window of the staircase. I thought of all kinds of other <laughs> things I should have mentioned, but I won't mention those here today. Um, but it, and, and it's really truly, it's you know, it's been a we thing. It's not a me thing. Um, the staff is just so supportive and so good to work with. Um, I you know I leave 
I leave uh, you in in good hands. I think um, very capable staff and really take the football approach. It's next person up. There's everyone. Everybody's replaceable. Everybody brings different skills and abilities to a position. Uh, we're going to be we're going to be just fine. So appreciate it. Thanks. And I do believe that wit is the soul. Uh, I mean, brevity is, is the soul of wit. Brevity is the soul of wit. Well, let's do another one. <laughs> Thank you. And speaking of moving forward and having an agency in great shape to do that, the recruitment update, and this will be just very quick, we do have a very robust list of candidates who have applied for the, the job, the new um, executive director for ODFNW. The screening panel, you, several of you, most of you have heard the, the process we came up with for the recruitment and adopted in the commission, and the screening panel is next in, in line or just about next in line to identify the candidates to move forward, and that will happen over the next several weeks. We are, of course, after that, looking at a series of interviews, including the public one in May the, on the 10th, and the Fish and Wildlife Commission one on the 10th, and the governor will interview the candidates, of course, in between those. Um, on the 10th, when the commission interviews the, the candidates, um, per, Perfection would be coming up with a candidate by the end of that day. It could take a little bit longer. If it takes a little bit longer, we will take that time, but that is our, our time to interview. So that's the process. That's what it looks like right now. And thank you to all of the people who have responded and, and provided input on, on what we should be looking for, what's important to the state, what's important to the resource. And so that's where we're headed with the, the recruitment. Um, Looks like Commissioner um, Labhart, you had a quick re update yes, as well. Yeah, yeah this is going to be a little bit anticlimactic to Kurt. <laughs> sure, but, Anything would be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I just wanted to let the commission and the public know, uh, you know, I have the privilege of sitting on OWEB and I sit on the grants committee and Tuesday uh, we approved um, $51 million grants, uh, $50 million in grants to four uh, partnerships. It's called the FIP program, Focused Investment Partnership. And I just wanted to let the commission know this and, and the public know this because it's a big deal. Uh, Hood River uh, Basin got funded uh, for aquatic restoration and initiative projects in the Hood River Basin. Uh, Klamath Lake Health Partnership got funded for uh, in Lake County uh, for Lands Restorations Initiative, and it's the dry forest types, uh, thinnings, prescribed burning, those kind of things. And then the, the Oregon Sage Grouse Habitat Initiative, which involves uh, Crook, Harney, Mount Here, uh, Lake Counties, um, a huge effort, um, $10 million sage grouse uh, projects to imp uh, implement habitat improvements for sage grouse. And then finally, the Harney Basin Wetlands Collaborative, which is an integrated wetlands management in Harney uh, basins. Uh, it's called the Oregon Closed Lake Basin Wetlands Habitat Partnership. It's a six-year program. They get funded every biennium for two years for a total of $51 million. It's going to come from OWEB funds to do that. So, um, you know, we, we talk about a million dollars here, a million dollars here, but I can tell you OWEB's doing some really good things for fish and wildlife, uh, and these four projects are an example of that. So I just wanted to report that out. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Labhart. We will go then to um, public forum and with great appreciation to people who have waited all morning for this. Let's go first. The, the first three people will be Representative Court Boyce, then Leonard Krug, and then David Moskowitz. And I will have all three. Do we need to? Oh, oh okay. 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 Well, thank you, Chair Wall. You mentioned Langless. Um, my grandfather was born there in 1886, so we have some similar roots. Director Milger, we are really going to miss you, and I mean that with all sincerity. That How do you say goodbye to someone that's worked in public service for 30 years? 
So, uh, hey, I told you the sun was going to come out. Thank you for coming to Douglas County for the record. My name is Court Boy, State Representative District 1, which is part of uh, Douglas County, part of Coos, and all of Curry County. So when it comes to the reason I want to comment today is because of uh, fish restoration. Um, Commissioner King mentioned that uh, when we have fires, the landscape is scorched with uh, additional or la I should say lack of shade. Water temperatures come up. You know, our fish are pretty hardy, but they uh, it's tough for them to adapt to temperatures that rise. And so uh, I will always be involved in forest management in protecting our watersheds. I'm, I'm, I represent the Wild Rivers Coast, which is arguably some of the most beautiful streams in the, on the planet, at least, maybe the entire world. When Jedediah Smith come through here 20 years after the Lewis and Clark expedition, what did he find? The biggest trees on the planet with the redwoods and the duck fir. And he said the fish were so thick that he could walk on the backs of the salmon, not get his feet wet. But his horse was a coward and had to swim. So anyway, we're, uh, I'm just glad to be here today. And I learned a lot. And uh, uh, when, again, when it comes to fish recovery and uh, our hatcheries, I made three trips to the Coal Rivers Fish Hatchery in 2022 as a county commissioner, worked with Sean Clements, the, uh, uh, the works for you folks, and uh, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, uh, Senator Merkley's office, uh, Congressman Cliff Benz, very active in trying to um, repair that 50-year-old facility. I remember when... In, doing my tour boat uh, operations in the early 70s and seeing that dam being completed in, in that hatchery, it was a very exciting time for Southern Oregon. So also the commissioners from the three road basin counties, Bruce Curry and, and Josephine. And then uh, to see the tribe involvement, tribal involvement, uh, especially the last couple of years uh, with uh, commissioners Labhart and Spellbrink, we went up to the Cow Creek and saw the efforts that they're making. And it's just, quite heartening to see uh, the Coquille tribe on the Coos River. Um, you know, I'll conclude essentially with this. The, the struggle that Oregonians have with the somewhat competition between the wild fish and the hatchery fish, the studies just clearly show in my view, and I've done some research, that they're, they're not competing, that they are the same DNA and I believe very strongly that the hatchery fish actually enhances the survivability of the wild fish. So keep up the good work. Keep Sean uh, Clements going and uh, we'll keep putting pressure on the federal government, that funding that's there for Coal Rivers and other hatcheries. As you know, there's a lot of pressure on that uh, that system because of losing the, uh, the, Archie, the, the Rock Creek during the Archie Creek fires. So I know you're all aware of that. Thank you again for that work. And uh, one more thing that uh, Commissioner King mentioned, the wildfire uh, with the, I'm very sorry, I honestly did not catch that we didn't fund the coexistence on the, you know, the chronic uh, disease portions there. Please remember when it comes to wildfires that those uh, deer, elk, and uh, even wild horses, we now have proved that they are native to North America. The black-tailed deer eat seven pounds of grass and brush fire fuel a day. The mule deer up to 10 or 12 pounds. Elk, 25 pounds. A wild horse will eat 30 pounds of grass and brush a day. So uh, we need to do everything we can to enhance, increase those populations. They are nature's weed eaters. And the danger that Oregon has for fires is just tremendous, as you all know. And I'll also be working on that uh, as long as I'm in the legislature and protecting all that I can, especially when it comes to public safety. Thank you again, Chair Wall. I, excuse me, I could have mentioned uh, Senator Bradbury. I, I carried on the House side SCR 204. He was the, and, and Brock Smith carried it on, in the Senate for, you know, he was the originator. He was my state representative, then Senator, and then Secretary of State. And uh, I, forgive me, I'm taking longer than I should, but just the work that he did on the step program and the in the enhanced the increased technology and improvements that we've seen in the last 40 years since he uh carried that vision just tremendous so uh, and he's from he's from curry county too not originally but uh we're anyway we're proud of the work he did thank you again
Thank you, Representative Boyce, Chair Wall, and Commissioners. My name is Leonard Krug, and I serve as the president for the Oregon Anglers Alliance. I know that we as habitat restoration people can understand it when I say that it takes two tools to dig a hole to plant a tree, a digging bar and a shovel. You can get the job done with one or the other by themselves, but it may take a very long time. So I think this, the same can be said for salmon in regard to habitat restoration and hatchery programs. Now we are happy to see our Native American brothers and sisters here today because we share many of the same cultural values and management strategies, especially when it comes to salmon. Together, we understand the value of using all of the tools in the toolbox in order to provide more immediate and balanced solutions to restoring our salmon populations, our culture, and the environment that we all depend on. Now, uh, I should start out by saying the Oregon Anglers Alliance applauds ODFW staff and our legislators for appropriating funding for monitoring on the Oregon portion of the Klamath River Restoration Project. And we look forward to helping you to secure future funding for hatchery conservation plans for the upper basin. And special thanks to Representative Court Voice, who is happily with us here today. According to the pie chart on page 17 of the NOAA Programmatic Killer Whale Draft, the Columbia River Basin Federal Mitigation Program produces 62% of hatchery production, the Salish Sea 28%, Washington Coast 7% and the Oregon Coast contribution is a mere 3%. I think it's safe to say that comparatively, Oregon is very conservative when it comes to its hatchery programs. Now on page 14, NOAA offers annual funding for Oregon to increase hatchery production. And we look forward to uh, helping the agency implement NOAA's preferred alternative. Now we have spent untold millions of dollars enlisting private partners for habitat restoration. And we are interested in exploring how we may enlist private partners to help us with our hatchery production shortfalls. It's time to examine how we are using the unfinished, inconclusive and questionable re reduced reproductive success paper pol policy management. And finally, to date, there have been 28 populations of salmon listed under the ESA on the West Coast alone, and despite over five decades of protections and habitat restoration efforts, not one has been recovered. Some say that there may be more funding for fish scarcity in the industry that has been built around it than for fish abundance. And we realize that the quality of salmon produced is dependent on our managers providing the tools needed to afford all of the tools in our toolbox if we are to successfully restore our environment. So thank you for this opportunity to provide comment. Thank, thank you. you, and thank you for coming up and being on the tour as well. So thank you both. And thank we'll, you. we'll move to Chair. David Moskowitz. Chair. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Firewoman. <laughs> Before you two guys walk away, thanks to both of you. Nice to meet you today, Rep. Um, and I just wanted to take this opportunity um, this is something I always talk about, particularly with um, Commissioner Hatfield Hyde, but with many others, and that I am sick of the rural urban divide. And we need to flip that to a rural urban dialogue. We have so much more in common. We are so much more alike than we are different. And one of the reasons I mentioned fire, and Commissioner Khalil was there as, with me, is that when the five fires were burning simultaneously, one of which was this one, Archie Creek, and no one in Portland could breathe. So fire is not just a rural problem. It is absolutely also an urban problem. And it's not just the fire, it's the smoke. And if we don't deal with this, this is quite literally gonna be the death of us all. So it is really good to kind of hear another voice saying the same thing from another direction because maybe we can come together on that. And I also wanna mention, you know, when we talk about um, just acknowledging and knowledge in place and where we are and who we are, um, as we're here amongst the clouds and this beautiful, beautiful place, we also need to remember we're coming to the 10th anniversary of the biggest mass shooting in Oregon history. That happened right here. So, and I was a doctor, I was a doctor. Um, I wasn't involved in this mass shooting. I was involved in the Springfield one, which happened earlier. But I think it, it you know, it, it's not tangential because our popos, meaning our Fish and Wildlife Police, our officers that are always in the back and that just like they are today, 
they were the first on scene for that shooting here. Okay, so, you know, I always claim them. I always mention them. We give 35 million of our budget to them, which is, becomes 51% of theirs. So they're like, they're ours. I claim them. And incidents like that is why. So I think we just need to acknowledge all of these in, in our in the place that we are um, and acknowledge, you know, what we do for fish and wildlife, but also that human dimension. And, and again, gun violence isn't just an urban problem. It's a rural one just, just, just as big. So thank you to both of you. I, 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 that's why I love the tours and I love coming to these places because I think it is important to make those connections and to stop with the divide, just stop it. Thank you. Thank you for mentioning the human dimension. My middle son is a Lieutenant with OSP and uh, I, a lot of prayers for, for all those men and women that are there every day and see the worst. Thank you. One more. Just just a quick confirmation on that. I do appreciate having these guys in the back of the room. I've known some of them through my career fishing and stuff like that. And like I say, I, I greatly appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Chair Wall, I did bring a PowerPoint with me. No. <laughs> <laughs> you just went over the edge. <laughs> Thank Thanks, you very guys. much. Um, David Moskowitz, and then the next three people are Mike McCoy, Shane Stalling, and Kirk Blaine. David? Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Chair Wall, Vice Chair Hathold Hyde, and Director Melcher, members of the Commission. Uh, it was a pleasure to join you as part of the tour yesterday, and I'd like to say thanks to uh, Sarah Gregory and her Umqua team for uh, a lovely, uh, lovely time and tour. Uh, Regarding, I'm going to talk on just two subjects really quickly. And uh, the first is the hatchery evaluation and make two points on that. It's really important to know that there's wide scientific agreement that hatcheries are not effective at conserving wild fish, with the exception of capt captive brood stock programs like for the Snake River sockeye. The track record doesn't support the widespread use for conservation. If hatchery production for conservation or for fisheries worked, we would be awash in returning fish with fewer fish reclosures. Uh, that's not the case. So there's something wrong and that's why the study is so important. Uh, the hatchery system we have is 150 years old um, and this study must and will provide a blueprint for the commission and the whole state. Uh, and I think it was described as a blueprint and a, and a roadmap by uh, Dr. Clement, which we really support. For the next 100 years, um, that's what we got to look forward to, and that's what we hope this budget note requirement and the one million dollars that the legislature contributed to fund it with the department, with a third with third party contractors, it's going to require a deep dive into the the whole wild and hatchery fish management uh, regime. And we support the conservation angler supports a very active and deep engagement of the Fish and Wildlife Commission to achieve this, um, to make the most of the opportunity. Uh, finally, I just want to say when I worked as a full time lobbyist, uh, Kurt was the lobbyist for the department and the. Uh, it was just it was very it was very fun to work with him and uh, I just want to wish director Melcher a healthy, healthy and happy retirement and make two things make note of two things at the staff recognition events in August. Kurt can, can he knows the staff's spouse, he knows what sports their children play in their local schools. It's incredible. And I've always admired you for that, uh, Director Melcher. It, it's really, truly wonderful uh, to watch you give recognition to the, to the ODFW staff. And I, I just appreciate the depth of the knowledge you have. And I know that comes with time and 40 years has given you that, but you really, you give it back and I appreciate that. And the second thought, and this actually comes from Jim Myron, um, something he, he made very clear is that under Director Melcher's um, guidance, the department has brought many talented women into leadership. It's changed dramatically from my first commission meeting, which was probably in 1991. Uh, and I think that's tremendous for the agency and we see that talent on display every day and just wanna say thank you and have a great time. Thank you, David. Thanks. I'm sorry, I don't know you, so Mike. I'm, you're Mike, yes. okay. Then you're next on the list, so go right ahead, please. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for coming down to our area. Um, we do appreciate it, and hope you 
you had a good tour. Possibly you saw the, the dam yesterday um, or have in the, yeah. in the past. Um, the whole Umpqua River system is very, very uh, personal to me. Um, I've been on this system both fishing and recreating since the late 50s. And I can see you doing the math. Uh, that's, I know that's a while and all the way from the ocean to the mountains. And so I take it very personally what's happening on the river right now. Um, it's heartbreaking. Um, I know you've got all the facts. I know you've had those draped across you and knowing that you do your jobs. I know you're well versed on that. I'm not gonna lay a bunch of facts on you. But uh, one of the things I think is important is that as human beings, sometimes the facts and the science they get put aside because of our visual take on things. You know, human beings are very visual. And uh, sort of like me walking up here, you can make a quick assumption that he looks okay. You know, he's got decent clothes on, he walked up here. Um, but the truth of the matter is, that's not always the case. You know, beneath all that, you have arthritis and joints that are going out and scar tissue and from foolish things you did when you were a child, you know, and you know, the dam is sort of me. I am sort of the dam because when you look at the dam, your visual impression is of this copacetic thing. This beautiful little veil of water, especially during the summertime is coming over and it's roiling into this one nice white foam below and it gives you the impression, like clothes do to a person, that everything is sort of sort of great there. It looks good. It looks like everything's working. The problem is um, it's not, and it's what you can't see that is the problem. So with this faint veil and curtain of water that comes over, it's only this thick. It doesn't support the fish. So you would think as they jumped, they would just come back down uh, but that's not what happens. They go through the veil of water, and what beh is behind the water is what the problem is. We have giant stobs of rebar sticking out, hundreds of them across the face of the dam. You have bare metal, bare wood, rocks, and concrete, and that is where the fish end up when they come and jump on the on the curtain of water coming over the dam. Unfortunately, the um, fish ladder, a substandard fish ladder, is at the complete wrong side of the river. All the fish, especially in the summertime, come up on the south side and the ladders on the north side. So they have 400 feet of that water to negotiate before they can even find the fish ladder. They eventually do. Many of them get tired of that process, drop back down into the first holes under the bridge where you can fish and get hammered and caught 10 times before they wanna come back up and keep trying to get over the dam. So the dam, and it's not just you know the upstream travel, this is a double-edged sword for our river system. Not only do they have to fight to get over the dam, the, in the spring when the, when the smolts come down, they can't find the fish ladder. They end up at the face of the dam and they get predatored like crazy on the top by the mergansers and other flocks of birds that feed on them. When they do go over the edge of the dam, they end up stunned and get fed on by the blue herons and ospreys. And so I just wanted to remind you that listen to the facts, you know, know what the science is and, uh, you know, be firm in your stance that we don't have to go through another ecological disaster like we did last summer. So th thank you for the time. Thank you, Mike. Um, go ahead, Kirk. Okay. Chair Wall, Commissioners, Director Melcher. I'm Kirk Blaine, Southern Oregon Coordinator for Native Fish Society and President of Steamboaters. I reside in Roseburg. I am testifying today regarding summer steelhead in the North Encore River. As you are aware, summer steelhead populations are facing significant challenges. The three-year average for wild summer steelhead is 919, 
The 10 year average is 1,807 and the 50 year average is 3,613. This decline is not cyclical. I commend the commitment of the ODFW commission to restore an all wild steelhead in North Umpqua in 2022. The benefits of the commitment will be realized in the decades to come. However, there are other factors that are affecting summer steelhead in the North Umpqua River. Winchester Dam presents a significant obstacle impeding access to 160 miles of prime spawning and rearing habitat for wild native fish. The dam's presence is causing population level impacts by delaying harming and killing summer steelhead. I thank ODFW and the commission for holding Winchester Water Control District and the contractors accountable for the ecological disaster this past summer. Oregon Water Resources Department has issued a notice to Winchester Water Control District indicating a need for inspection and or repairs this in the near future. This notice will necessitate the isolation of the dam face and either by draining the reservoir pool again or building coffer dams to isolate and, and work on the dam face. Moving forward, I ask ODFW and the commission not to allow Winchester Water Control District to drain in the reservoir pool. Instead, require the district to build coffer dams for any future use. Require volitional fish passage throughout this process during the inspections and our repairs. These methods have been used elsewhere in the state of Oregon for repairs and maintenance. We ask the commission and the department to do everything possible to prevent a catastrophic event similar to what happened last summer. Once again, I thank you all for the time and consideration today. It is imperative that we take every possible measure to protect North Umpqua summer steelhead and all other native migratory fish by preventing the ongoing harm caused by Winchester Dam. Thank you, Kurt. I don't have questions. Um, so we'll go to Shane Stalling. And sorry, I took you out of order, Shane. Go right ahead and you'll have three minutes, if you will. Thank you. Uh, Chair of all commissioners, Director Melcher. Uh, first, want to say, Director Melcher, thank you for this opportunity and thank you for all you have done for the state of Oregon. I wish you a very well deserved retirement. My name is Shane Stalling, and I'm here to represent myself as both a Coos County resident and Oregon fishing license holder. I'm also representing the Wild Steelhead Coalition, an organization of steelhead anglers committed to restoring wild steelhead populations and their native watersheds to levels that provide self sustaining runs and economic vitality to local communities, which is what part of my testimony is about today. Based on ODFW, I'm concerned about the well being of wild steelhead in the many of our South Coast rivers, and I want to briefly cover Winchester Dam and Rogue River Wild Harvest. Um, Kirk hit some of this already, uh, but some high level thoughts on Winchester Dam is that the full extent of damage from the dam fish passage closure uh, this last summer with lethal water temperatures is still unknown. There's still leaks and structural issues in the dam. Recent high flows exposed continued fish passage problems and notices indicate potential future dam isolation for inspections repairs, which jeopardizes fish passage once again. So I ask that ODFW prioritizes that when future dam work occurs, we must mandate the use of coffer dams to maintain fish passage. And we also urge the commission to consider the long-term solution of removing Winchester Dam entirely. Moving south to the coast on the Rogue River and other south coast uh, wild steelhead rivers, the return numbers of 22 and 23 Rogue River Huntley Park half pounder counts, a strong indicator of future winter wild, wild winter steelhead returns have fallen to equal or below the conservation status for two consecutive years. We should listen to these fish and act sooner rather than later. Is wild harvest sustainable for returning all adults based on the 2023 RSP wild fish monitoring summaries? There's no data for the proportion of wild fish harvested in the individual sections of the road. Adult population estimates and harvest proportions by sections are essential in managing these populations for sustainability. We are at the conservation threshold for our primary forecasting tool for the Rogue River. We know it's going to be bleak in the coming years, and because 75% of the fish caught in the low, lower Rogue are all wild, we need to reconsider Rogue River wild winter steel at harvest in all sections of the river, not just the middle and upper sections. 
Outside of the Rogue, a bleak winter ret return forecast on the Rogue should raise concerns for other coastal rivers with wild harvest allowances, especially with the lack of 2023 data, which includes no, no 23, 2023 data for the Elk, Hunter Creek, Pistol River, Chetco River, Winchuck River, and Rogue Rivers itself. All of these rivers allow wild harvest, harvest but have unknown sustainability numbers. To sum it all up, the data that we do have shows a high probability of a large decrease in run numbers, and we should make decisions that give wild steelhead as much opportunity to reproduce as possible. The missing 2023 wild steelhead data is necessary to determine the sustainability of wild harvest. The NPGO index continues to show less than favorable ocean conditions, and it would be wise to be prudent. This all necessitates a re this all nece necessitates a reevaluation of the sustainability of wild steelhead harvest, not only on the Rogue River but along the entire South Coast. Thank you. Thank you, Shane. The next three people are Jeffrey Dose, um, Wayne Schweizer, and Ann Merrill. And after that, the three are Charlie Pilon, Pilon, um, Matt Hill, and then John Nichols. So. Jeffrey, yes, please. That would be great. Thank you. Good. And I think that Ann Merrill, I believe, is on line. So we'll start with you, Jeff, if you will, and then if you'll introduce yourself for the record. Certainly. Thank you, Chair Wall, um, Commissioners, Director Melcher. I would also like to congratulate you on your upcoming retirement and wish you all the best. Thank you. My name is Chef Dose. I'm a retired fisheries biologist. Um, spent 31 years uh, working professionally in the Umpqua River Basin. I'm a longtime resident of Douglas County. Uh, I live on the North Umpqua River and have sought summer steelhead, not always successfully, but um, <laughs> tried for over 60 years in the North Umpqua. I'm very concerned about the alarming declining trend of summer steelhead in the north. Um, I have provided uh, testimony before you previously on this topic. Uh, I'm speaking for myself, not as a member of any organization or group. While I realize there are many factors in this decline, Beyond, that are beyond your control. There are some that I believe are in your control. And there are two issues I would like to uh, address today. The first being consistency with the Coastal Multi-Species Conservation and Management Plan, CMP. It established population levels for summer steelhead in the North Umpqua for um, critical and um, desired. Um, and it further goes on to direct that the population, if the population trends drop below um, or, or are moving towards the critical level, if they drop below or are moving towards critical abundance, uh, the commission should take some action, which you wisely did in 2022 with the hatchery. The trend over the last 10 plus years is a substantial decline towards and even below the identified critical level at some times. Stunningly, seven of the 10 lowest returns in the 77 year period of record have occurred since the adoption of the CMP in 2014. And these include all of the last six years, 2018 through 2023. There's no documented movement towards achieving the desired level. Obviously, it's going the wrong direction. While I know it is a difficult decision, I commend the department for closing the river to all angling in 2021 and again in 2023 due to this situation. While difficult, it was the right decision. My second issue is, um, as you've already heard uh, from Shane and Kirk, 
um, impacts from the presence of Winchester Dane. Um, first, I would like to express my thanks for your timely and effective response to this disastrous fish kill this past summer. Winchester Dam is causing delay and injury to migrating adult summer steelhead and other species due to false attraction flows resulting in delays. And for summer steelhead, this is particularly stressful during because it is a period of high water temperatures. And also the, the jumping and um, falling that Mike McCoy mentioned uh, on, on the bedrock and concrete causes damage and injury. Injury also occurs when outmigrating smolts are flushed over the 17 foot high dam, often landing on shallow bedrock and <clears throat> concrete. The 77 year old fish ladder is poorly located, has ins insufficient attraction flow, is in disrepair, and results in delay and injury as migrants frequently fall back while attempting to pass through the fish ladder upstream. If additional inspection and or repairs are required in the future, the department should require methods uh, of, for dewatering that maintain volitional fish passage, such as the use of coffer dams, as has been mentioned previously. Finally, um, unfortunately, I'm disappointed that some local past and present ODFW employees have characterized the latter in public as not problematic. In conclusion, the wild summer steelhead population is on a severe downward trend. There are actions within your control that can respond to this situation. One, stopping the hatchery program, which was already you have already wisely done. And two, conducting a passenger review of Winchester Dam. This should entail requiring package passage facilities that meet current criteria and standards, both upstream and downstream. And the impacts from Winchester Dam can and should be thoroughly addressed. Jeff, if you were able. You. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, let's go ahead and please introduce yourself for the record. Uh, Wayne Spicer, uh, Roseburg, Oregon. Uh, Commissioners, uh, Director Melcher, Chair Wall, thank you for coming to Roseburg. It's great to see you guys. <laughs> Please come visit great us more time. often. Uh, forgive me if I stumble a little bit in my presentation. I'm recovering from what I call a couple of remanufactured eyes. So I can see here, but I can't see you. So <laughs> wave your hand if you need to get my attention. Um, I would like to respectfully ask the commission to not back down from the fine that you levied on the Winchester Water Control District for the killing of 550,000 lamprey eel. I've been involved for many years with the shortcomings of Winchester Dam, dating back as uh, far as when Peter DeFazio was an aide to Congressman Jim Weaver. So that gives you a little idea how long it's been, almost 50 years. Killing of the lamprey and other problems at Winchester, in my opinion, is just another incident of ignore the rules and regulations and ask for forgiveness later. So please don't let them wiggle out of this fine that you have imposed upon them. It's time that they be held accountable for what happened last summer? My second item, um, a byproduct of the stocking of tiger and brown trout in Diamond Lake to help control the Tui chub has resulted in a truly unique fishery. Where else do you have a chance to go and catch multiple tiger and brown trout 20 to 25 inches and larger in a day's fishing. Very, very rare. Chatter on the street that I'm hearing is that at some point you will be asked to rescind the catch and release regulation on these fish. <laughs> For the sake of this unique fishery and the program's purchase, 
purpose of controlling the two to each other, which are unfortunately present again in the lake, along with golden shiners. I ask respectfully that you decline any such request to change the catch and release regulation of these fish. Lastly, um, years ago, uh, your department initiated a popular program which stocked lakes throughout the state with larger than normal sized trout and what they called legals. These trout were originally called trophy trout uh, and now they're called pounders, although they still appear as trophy trout in your stocking schedule. And they're typically 14 to 17 inch trout, which are quite fun to catch. And uh, I think the public was really received that, uh, well received that, that program. While this program continues in other areas of the state on a regular basis, it's been over three years since our area has been listed on the department's printed stocking schedule to receive these fish. While staff has indicated some fish of this size have been randomly released from time to time, I would like to once again see our area included in a regular stocking of these fish. I realize that the loss of the Ross Creek, Rock Creek hatchery has made this a complicated situation, but there are lots of areas in the state that still receive these fish and maybe we could mm -hmm. Get some for us, please. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And we'll go to Ann Merrill and then Charlie Ibon, and you should correct the pronunciation. Thank you both. So Ann and then Charlie and then Matt Hill. Go ahead, Ann. Hi. We'll have can three you... Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Three minutes. Gotcha. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, dear members of the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife Commission, thank you so much for the opportunity to provide public comment. Uh, it's really an honor to be here to testify before you today. My name is Annie Merrill. I am the Ocean and Estuaries Manager at Oregon Shores Conservation Coalition, and I'm also the co-chair of a newly formed Oregon Ocean Alliance, which consists of eight founding member organizations working together on shared priorities aimed to advance the protection of Oregon's ocean and coastal ecosystems. And these founding members include Audubon Society of Lincoln City, Bird Alliance of Oregon, Coast Range Association, Environment Oregon, The Nature Conservancy, Oceana, Oregon Shores, and Surfrider Foundation. The Alliance is extremely pleased to see the Marine Reserve Bill, House Bill 4132, uh, pass in the Oregon Le State Legislature last week. And we're really proud of our collective efforts to build support for the bill. Um, we worked really hard on that. So uh, the bipartisan bill passed almost entirely unanimous unanimously in both the House and the Senate. It was backed by both the Coastal and Environmental Caucuses. So it was a wildly popular bill. Additionally, hundreds of letters were sent to legislators by Oregonians in support. Um, our organization's members and supporters have been advocates for the Marine Reserve since their inception, and we really wish to see the recommendations from the decadal review of the program to be adopted by the agency, which includes an increase in funding to support meaningful community engagement and adaptive management. And these recommendations are based on strong science from OSU researchers and endorsed by the Ocean Policy Advisory Council. So now ODFW leadership has the backing of the legislature and the people of Oregon to move these recommendations forward to bolster our marine reserve program. And we urge that the commission please ensure that the fiscal that's outlined in the bill is integrated into the ODFW uh, 2025 through 2027 budget for the intended staff positions so that the, the policies that are outlined in the bill can be moved forward successfully. The Oregon Ocean Alliance supports ODFW um, and is very appreciative of everything the Marine Reserves Program has accomplished so far to understand our marine environment. Um, so like right now we're celebrating this win for coastal communities and we're just really excited about the future of the marine reserves. So we hope the commission and ODFW leadership is excited too. 
And now the ball is in your court to ensure that the agency budget for the program reflects this historic investment. Um, so thank you so much for your time and consideration. Thank you, Annie, and I don't see questions, so we will go on to Charlie Plybon. And then um, Matthew, go ahead, Charlie. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Thanks, Chair Wall and members of the commission. Thank you for this opportunity to comment. Uh, for the record, my name is Charlie Plybon. I am the Oregon Policy Manager for Surfrider Foundation. I live in South Beach, Oregon. And as an avid waterman, fisher, and lover of our ocean, I want to take a minute to highlight recent important investments for ODFW's Marine Resources Program and the need for continued prioritization of the agency in investing in our marine resources. Uh, I heard a lot today about ODFW's infrastructure and hatcheries, and I'd just like to remind the Commission that ODFW's staff is perhaps the most important agency infrastructure. So please consider staffing in your budget priorities. Um, particularly given the comments and interest of the commission to work with communities uh, and, to engage, and to engage in important cultural and natural resource issues. I heard a lot about hatchery infrastructure and no matter what investments we make in our hatcheries inland, it is the ocean conditions and the management and adaptation to those conditions that ultimately drives the success of those hatcheries. And I'm reminded today of my first testimony to this commission just over 17 years ago. I sat before Chair Marla Ray and the Commission in Salem to testify on the importance of investing in these very marine resources, um, specifically through long-term monitoring and the programmatic development of marine reserves and protected areas. It was then a very highly contentious and divisive issue. I sat next to a gentleman at the podium, Walter Chuck, uh, who was representing the Recreational Fishing Alliance and testifying highly in opposition. Little did I know that today I would years later become friends with Walter. He's been one of my bestest fishing buddies and served with him uh, on the Oregon Ocean Policy Advisory Council for nearly a decade. Fast forward two governor's offices executive orders, six years of tireless work following a powerful Oregon Way process that put our coastal communities first, the Marine Reserve Program within ODFNW was born. The program serves as Oregon's only investment in long-term ecosystem-based monitoring to help us better understand and adapt to changing ocean conditions. From sea star wasting to a rising and changing fisheries to warming seas and ocean acidification, the challenges to our coastal resources and our ocean-based economies are real. The Marine Reserve Program is a proactive opportunity for us to better understand and manage our changing seas and the people and Oregon economies that depend on them. Uh, just, as you, just as you just heard, you know, last week, the Oregon's legislature reaffirmed that commitment to this important program following a decade of implementation Today, the Marine Reserve Program realizes a fabric of trust, an opportunity where once a divisive idea existed. Both Marine Resource Program staff and the tireless engagement and sacrifice of coastal officials <laughs> and communities and tribes are to thank for that. In nearly unanimous fashion, the Oregon Legislature moved House Bill 4132 to the floor, where a once ODFNW commissioner at the time of my testimony 17 years ago, and now State Representative Bobby Levy, made some statements. Echoing her statements in the Ways and Means process, she remarked on the House floor of the program's great success and the need for continued and increased investments in our communities in what was her favorite success in serving on the ODFNW Commission many years ago of the program's establishment. I today ask again for your continued investment in Oregon's marine resources and prioritization of programs like the Marine Reserve Program. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Um, we will then go to one more, John Nichols. And what about Matt Hill first? Oh, and Matt Hill, yes. <laughs> Matt Hill and then John Nichols. And John's online, right? Yeah. Not everybody that's been online. Okay. But we have one more after you, so. That's John fantastic. Nichols, you'll have three minutes. I didn't want to be the only person holding you back from lunch, so I'll leave that to the next witness. Um, Commissioners, thanks for uh, allowing me to be here today. My name is Matt Hill. I'm a board member of the Umpqua Fishery Enhancement Derby. Uh, welcome to the Umpqua Basin. Uh, Douglas County's boundaries are defined by the boundaries of the Umpqua River Basin. We used to be called Umpqua County uh, 100 years ago or so, and there's always been a strong connection between the residents here and, and fish and fishing. Um, you know, there's a lot of different opinions about these issues in this county, uh, whether it's dams or hatcheries or anything else, but everyone's passionate about it and they care about it. 
because we all want fish in the river and we all want to catch those fish. We just have different ways of doing it. So thanks for listening to us all. Um, I just wanted to do a quick situation here because you have one of the best views in the county in this room, uh, the North Umpqua River. If, if you could look out that window, uh, just to the left of the dam, there's a big flat area. And until 1856, that was the winter camp of the Upper Umpqua Indians. And they would camp there and wait for weather conditions to change and wait for fish to come. And around this time of year, the dogwoods would bloom and they would say when the dogwood blooms, the salmon jumps the falls. And they're talking about the falls up by where you were by Rock Creek yesterday, Tioga Falls. So they would start moving up there to their summer camp, which just is just at the base of Mount Scott with the snow up there. And they move back and forth throughout the year with the fish. And um, so it's you're on a really kind of important historic pathway um, that, that's timed with fish and seasons and food. Um, Back to back to business here, the Umpqua Fishery Enhancement Derby just held its 32nd annual four day event, which includes a student day, a kids day, guided angler teams. We had 40 teams on the rivers uh, fishing for winter steelhead and a sold out dinner auction with over 700 people, which raises money every year for fisheries enhancement projects. Uh, you typically raise about $100,000 each year. Um, our kids day involves taking elementary students kind of just over the hill up to Cooper Creek where our ODFW partners uh, dump some beautiful fish into the reservoir. Uh, we put the, ki the kids in boats with fishing guides and let them, them fish. And one interesting thing for you to know is that 75% of those kids that participate in that have never been in a boat and they've never been fishing. But after that, they're hooked. So it, it's a great event. We, we appreciate our, our partnership with ODFW on that. Uh, over the past 30 years, the Derby has awarded nearly $2 million in matching grants uh, to over 400 projects in the Umpqua Basin for fishery habitat improvement, for outdoor education, uh, for access. Uh, if you drove across to Old 99, there's Amaker Park right below the dam. It was packed this morning with trucks and fishing trailers because uh, the winter seal had run. Uh, we just helped improve the boat ramp to provide public access to that. Um, that's an example of the types of things we do. Um, if you get bored today, you can pull up umquafish.com on your phone. Uh, we install the camera next to your camera in the dam, and we provide 24-hour live footage of fish passing through the fish ladder uh, over the dam. Uh, to date, uh, I think 5,700 winter steelhead have passed, uh, which is a record, or it, it's on track to be a record. Um, just wait for the temperature of the water to increase by a, de a degree and start moving. Um, we also, we also had our first spring shimmick pass. Anyway, I just wanted to say we, we enjoy our partnership uh, with ODFW, the commission, and particularly at Rock Creek. And we look forward to working with the commission on the options uh, that are developed for reconstruction and resumption of, of activities of uh, fish production out there. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. And for the history as well about where the tribal activity was, could you say the website again? Umquafish.com. Thank you. Thank you very much. Then we will, seeing no questions, move to John Nichols. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate it. Hey, Matt. Can you leave that chair pushed out for? Oh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for hearing me today. This is in regards to <clears throat> ORS, when they began, John Nichols, um, Pioneer family out in Empaw Valley. Um, three days. Prior to Thanksgiving this year, we we're fortunate enough to receive a herd of elk onto our property, a herd of 48. Uh, we decided at that time we come from a family that hunt and fish a lot. That's all I've pretty much ever done other than work. And we had decided that this was going to be a safe haven for these elk. Um, amazing how many people want to shoot a pregnant elk at six months. They're we have both sides of the county road, and there was a gentleman that uh, came up the front of the elk to intimidate them from crossing the county road to go further back up on our piece of property. I called OSP. Unfortunately, the OSP officer that responded was close personal friends of the person that was trying to intimidate the elk from crossing. Therefore, after everything was done, the elk had crossed, and according to this or 498.012, they have permission to decimate herd of elk just because they crossed the fence. 
I watched them chase these elk with side by side and four wheelers and shoot these pregnant elk only to contact the OSP officer again and tell him what they were doing. And his response was, do you have a video? I woke up the next morning to at least 18 gunshots, if not more, and they were chasing those elk again with side-by-sides, pickups, shooting these pregnant elk just because they crossed the wrong fence. They chased them across the Calapulia Creek, which was about that time of the year this year. I think it was like a 24-foot flow rate on the main umpa. So the Calapulia was big full. Lived there all my life. I know when they chased those elk across the creek, a lot of them drowned. Probably, a lot of them were probably gut shot. And when they crossed the creek, they went around the creek, chased them again, but they're side by sides and their pickups shooting out again. I know from a history of hunting, when you have that many gunshots, at that point, you're just herd shooting. I, under the guise of this or number, I think the commission needs to revisit and add some wordage to this because there are 6,922 cows shot last year in the state of Oregon. A cow lives for 10 years, has one calf. You do the simple math. After 10 years, that's 70,000 possible elk that were shot. That's wiping out the city of Roseburg residents every three years. Population is 23,000. 25% of those would have been of a bull, which equals right around about 18,000 bulls over a 10 year period that could have been born that people could have shot. I just asked the commission to please think about looking at this verbiage and cleaning it up just because an animal crosses the fence and to do a mass annihilation of a herd elk. When I counted those elk when they crossed that road, there's only 20 animals left in that herd. I got a lot more to say, but I know I'm out of time and I know everybody wants to go in and have lunch and enjoy the, the sunshine. So we you appreciate are it. The time, but your points are well taken and we appreciate you waiting and testifying. So okay. thank you very much. Okay. Appreciate you, it, John. Um, commissioners, we have three more. Oh, yeah. Mark, do you want to do your update? And then we have no the president. But I thought he said, yes. oh, he did his update. Never mind. Sorry. Oh, you gave the agenda. Never mind. I got it. Okay. Yeah. So do you want to go to other business? Please, other business yes. Chair? Well, okay. yeah, we just switched who's going to do so that. So commissioners, yeah, I got it. Uh, commissioners, under other business, we did have one item that we wanted to uh, get your action on, and that is, and I'll just give you a little bit of background. The, the State Endangered Species Act, um, after the commission lists or uplists the species, it directs that the commission will meet with the other state landowning agencies to determine how they're going to move forward in, in adopting endangered species management plans. I'm paraphrasing here. <laughs> and of course, it's not practical for you all to meet with all the agencies. And so we typically, as was the case during Marble Merlets, we have you delegate that to the, to the department. And so what we have here for you today is a delegation um, where the commission will delegate to the department um, our uh, duties that we need to we need to complete with these other agencies and we would do that on your behalf and then of course the final plans will come back to you as per statute and i think mark or commissioner laphart may have the draft motion yes unless there's questions beforehand Go ahead. Uh, Madam Chair, I move to approve the delegation to the director to perform certain duties imposed by ORS 496-182 and associated rules. Second. <clears throat> Moved and seconded to adopt the motion on uplisting regulated 
delegation or related delegation um, as read into the record. Does anybody have questions? Let's do a thumb vote on this one. Those in favor? Unanimous, Michelle. So we will Thank move you. on to the next one. Um, commissioners, the next one, it is going to be even faster, I believe. Commission meeting needed minutes for the last meeting, which was February 16th. Are there any changes or additions? And if not, could I get a motion on this one? I move to approve the February 16th, 2024 meeting minutes and with continued authority to correct grammar and punctuation. I'll second. So moved and seconded to approve the commission meetings from February 16th, 2024 is read into the record. Those in favor? Unanimous, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll move on to assessment of fair market value for damages calculation. And I think we have John Seaborn. Thank you for hanging with us all this time to do this one. Sure. That's Chair, soon. Chair, while while uh, while John's getting sorry to cut you out no, there, no John, problem. I'll say while this is my last commission meeting, this is also the last time we'll be bringing this agenda item to you due to some statutory changes. So, John, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Wall, members of the commission. Uh, Director Melcher, for the record, my name is John Seaborn. I'm the operations manager for the Fish Division. And today we're going to talk about the scheduled damages, uh, hopefully for the last time. Um, as you remember, as you remember, uh, in January of each year, uh, you, you've approved the average market values for uh, commercial food fish. Uh, the purpose of establishing these values uh, was to uh, come up with a value in the event that the agency uh, would pursue a civil case against somebody for the unlawful taking of commercial food fish. Um, the pursuit of civil damages would be beyond, you know, the normal penalties that uh, a court would um, issue as part of a violation um, that was issued by the Oregon State Police or other enforcement agencies. So in the two, 2023 regular session, there were changes to these statutes, which is ORS 506-720, uh, which necessi necessitated changes and rules that I'll present today. So in the 2023 regular session, ODFW worked with both the governor's office and the legislator legislature to update the schedule of damages to both update the values and to simplify the damages that we could pursue. Uh, Senate Bill 887 changes the values for all species to twice the average market value, and it also removes the requirement for the commission to adopt a list of about 70 uh, species average market values January of each year. As you, as you remember, um, in statute, we had some fixed values for some of those species, which, you know, over time, prices and values go up. So um, we kind of sim simplified that in the bill and that we just switched it over to twice the average market value. So it wasn't as complicated as, as it was laid out before. Um, so to implement the new statute, 6350601, we're removing the definition of fair market value. Uh, and that is going to be moved over to 6350060232. Um, and we're going to have a reference in 001 um, to that new rule, 0232. Uh, and then in 6350060232, we no longer need to adopt the previous year's values. And instead, we're adding the definition of fair market value so that in the instance the agency does decide to pursue a civil case, we're using the most recent year's values and not, not a previous year that are outdated. So just a reminder, until this year, we'd bring the schedule of damages January of each year to the commission. Um, there are approximately 70 species that were listed out in that. Um, and that was those numbers were established using fish ticket data that the wholesale fish dealers turn into the agents. Um, again, the purpose of establishing those values were to come up with a value in case we decided to sue, pursue a uh, civil case against someone. Um, so to create that is pretty time consuming. Uh, we have somebody in our Nadine Hurtado on our fish ticket staff, and she spent a lot of time pulling those numbers from fish tickets and, and developing that. Um, and it's also required that we have the annual uh, schedule of damages that we present in front of the commission every year. Um, I've been here 27 plus years now. We've never pursued a civil case. Um, so every year we bring this to you, but it's never been used. Um, 
When there is a violation, OSP cites the person uh, that goes to court. The court decides the penalty for the infraction, and this is served as a sufficient deterrent to ensuring compliance with Oregon's commercial fishing laws. Um, so ODFW staff recommends to adopt the revised schedule of damages for commercial fishing violations as shown in attachment three. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, John. Questions? I think you'll just get congratulations on bringing and thank you for bringing this one to us. <laughs> uh, any questions, any commissioners? Questions? There are no people to testify on this one, so I'd be happy to make the motion. Um, oh, that's actually. Oh, you're doing? Yeah, no, just a comment. <laughs> I noticed that. Uh, thank you, Chair Wall. I noticed the picture in the front here is uh, the Ms. Law vessel there out of Newport. Uh, Jean Law, who I knew for years and years and years, just passed away this year. So, oh. he's about my age. <laughs> That's scary. <laughs> Second one this year. <laughs> just thought I'd mention that. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. All right. Um, I move to amend OAR 635006-0001 and OAR 635-006-0232 as proposed by staff. Second. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded to amend the, the OARs as read into the record to change the way we do the schedule of damages. Um, could we do a thumb vote on this one? Those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. And we are adjourned with enormous thanks to our retiring director. Directly across the hall here. Um, it's a small room and it's a beautiful day, so I didn't set up tables for everyone to sit inside in case somebody wanted to.